I think the Bank of England's been back to some extent into a corner by unorthodox fiscal policies. The BOE really needs to keep a hawkish eye on inflation and in controlling inflation. Markets aren't stable. Inflation changes everything and government central banks are going to try all kinds of things. Global markets moving 20, 30, 50 basis points off of one data point. I think that in and of itself is an indication of dysfunction. Today, we seem, you know, the economics of pandemonium. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. What a messy time, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. <laughs> Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down eight tenths of 1% on the S&P. TK, this market all over the place. Yeah, for me, it's that the crisis is not over. It continues today. But, John, it is different today. There is some stability to the markets as everybody hangs on every word we could hear from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The lady is not for turning, Tom. I imagine that might be the headline next week, the week after that. How long will that be the headline for? And at what point, Tom, will someone blink here? I think there's conflict right. all over the place. Mohamed El Arian talked about it yesterday. I think he framed it perfectly. Tom, for the central bank, the Bank of England, how do they tackle inflation and address financial stability risk simultaneously at the same time? Let me be more direct, John. They're trying to redux Reaganomics 1, and somehow they're going to get to Reaganomics 2, and they're bailing it out. I would point out, John, that this was a seven-standard deviation move Huge. That, that, that caused this. I think that Carl Weinberg, who will join us later, had the single best clarity of anyone out there. He said, it's real simple. You liquidate bonds for cash. That harkens back to the crises of the 90s. Lisa, when the risk is in, the risk-free asset. That's what we're experiencing at the moment. Yeah, there was this great point that Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank made this morning yeah, where he great. said, how could you have earned a 42% return from a triple A rated investment? Simple. At any time between 8 and 11 a.m., all you had to do is buy 40-year guilt, uh, and then you'd be fine. And honestly, how much does this highlight the volatility in a market where, to your point, the benchmark securities are flipping around <laughs> as though they were Bitcoin? Penny stocks all over the place. Can the Bank of England meet the moment? Tom alluded to this, and I think this is really important, this concept of fiscal dominance. Has the Bank of England contributed to the perception of fiscal dominance in the UK? And is that something, Lisa, they need to push back against and push it back against pretty hard? And this is why I was actually kind of shocked. Danny Blanchflower, who's always for easing policy, was saying that what he would do right now is an emergency 100 basis point rate hike by the Bank of England to try to shore up that credibility. What you're finding right now is after decades of monetary policy being, being able to plug deficits, being able to plug the gaps by fiscal policy, they've run out of time. And all of a sudden, deficits matter in a way that they haven't in the past. And this is going to be a theme not just for the UK, but for and many other developed nations. Equities this morning, and good morning to you. They are down. They are down again by nine tenths of 1% on the S&P. Big day of gains in yesterday's session. We unwind some of it. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 1.2%. Yields are higher again by 10 basis points to 383.60. I tell you, the range on the 10-year in the last 24 hours has been huge. Euro dollar negative four tenths of 1% on that currency pair, Lisa, 96. 92. And honestly, the way that things have been moving around makes it so difficult to pin down what's even important to be watching at a time when if you get some sort of UK emergency intervention and possibly uncapped buying for a limited amount of time, maybe uh, before a possible rate hike, it's very hard to game out the direction of where things are going. The direction of the data, though, does seem clear. At 8 a.m., we get German CPI. And the latest print, it looks like anecdotal data that came out earlier this morning, seems to suggest potentially a 10 percent CPI in Germany. That would be the highest going back in data to the 1990s and way beyond that. How much does this change the scenario? Because, yes, a lot of the central banks don't want to see systemic dysfunction, but they also don't want to see 10 percent inflation, especially at a time when it's unclear what's going to stop it, considering some of the uh, concerns on the energy front. At 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims, U.S. GDP on this is the third read, as well as personal consumption and core PCE for the second quarter. I am watching claims. I want to understand, do we start to see more of them tick up? You know, it, Liz Ann Saunders uh, put out a really interesting chart yesterday, and she put out an art interesting article where she was talking about how there are signs that there are cracks 
pretty big ones forming beneath the surface here. Who are losing their jobs? Are these full-time jobs that they're losing and then they're going into part-time employment so that a lot of companies don't have to pay benefits? That's something that she's been observing increasingly. And today we get some earnings, particularly from retailers. Bed Bath & Beyond uh, is at 7.30 uh, a.m. and the Nike after the bell. We also get from Micron Technology, the whole semiconductor story here. How much does that edify the feeling that we got from Apple, John, that we're getting a slowdown in demand for smartphones? We're getting a slowdown in demand for devices, a slowdown in demand for cars. Yep. How much does this really highlight the other side of the big tech story, the earnings side, that would be the other shoe to drop? Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, you know it, Lisa. He's been talking about it for a number of months now. Lisa, thank you very much. Dean Kernett joins us, founder and CEO of Macro Risk Advisors. Dean, you are the guest we wanted to talk to this morning. What do you do when the risk is in the risk-free asset? Yeah, this has been a theme that uh, we've been uh, looking at closely, John, for, for over a year. And I think the observation you could have made is that the global markets were transitioning from this environment in which the, the correlation between stocks and bonds was so friendly for the 60-40 portfolio. They mitigated one another, these two assets. And I think the key observation was that as the volatility of both assets was going to increase, so too was the correlation. And so for the 60-40 portfolio, that's quite an accelerant to the overall vol of the portfolio. Um, I, I think there's there's a couple of things you're supposed to do here. First of all, uh, when market prices react as violently as they have, I think you have to recognize that these prices aren't just a, a cause, they're they're an effect. Um, in, in other words, they, they motivate action, they motivated action from the BOE. Um, I think you're supposed to really um, step back and, and first observe that Equity prices are lower, so the entry point is better. We really don't know what's going to happen, um, but we also obviously see that there's a lot more vol in the markets. And so by doing nothing, you're effectively taking more risk. So you're supposed to um, either de-risk the equity portfolio, move up in quality. Um, I think you're supposed to take a look at holding pattern trades. And I just would, I just look at the two-year note yielding 4.2%. Not a bad place to be. Um, I think at the end of the day, if this financial dysfunction gets bad enough, the Fed is going to have to blink. Every yeah. central bank, you saw it from the BOE, they will have to well, play some role in financial stability. And so that two-year note's a good place to hide out. I think, Dean, I had a beverage of choice in my hand in 2008 as I looked at slews and kurtosis of all these dynamics. You did the same thing. And the bottom line, as you just said, as this comes over to central bank policy and theory, Back then, it was a four standard deviation move. Yesterday, we had a seven standard deviation move on UK gilts. Is that enough to move Chairman Powell to amend and adjust the dialogue and to amend and adjust the policy? I, I don't think yet. Uh, but I, again, I think this move in the back end of the gilt curve is as shocking as could be. We're all out, trying to outdo each other in terms of the stat that uh, resonates the most. And I'll just throw mine at you, which is the five day realized vol on the gilts market on the 30 year at least is 10 times the five day realized on Bitcoin. <laughs> so um, th these are these are volatile times. Um, I think one of the things we're supposed to watch is correlations uh, with respect to rates and all other risk assets. And I, I think if you if you see U.S. real rates rise to the extent they have and with the speed they have and the negative reaction to equities at some point, it's hard to know when, but at some point, even the Fed blinks. Um, we yeah. don't know if that's going to happen. But in the meantime, you're supposed to take a real good look at your equity portfolio. And of course, um, Tom, you know, we specialize in derivatives. The interesting thing is the derivatives markets are actually providing some really, really compelling entry points yeah. in what I would just call risk managed equity. There's a, an old trade called the collar. You buy a put and you finance it by selling a call. The setup on that trade is as compelling as I've seen it in two decades. It's quite a fascinating, fascinating setup. And if you're going to dip your toe back into the, the world of risk, and let's just use the S&P as the starting point, you can put the boundaries, you can put the guardrails up on your portfolio at pretty efficient prices right here. Is this the black swan trade? And I ask because John started by saying, what do you do when the risk is in the risk-free assets? And traditionally, that has been the recipe for a massive financial market meltdown. That is the recipe that we have needed to see, is when the risk is in areas that were perceived to be risk-free. How much is this the black swan trade that you need to be putting on? 
Yeah, I think it, it, it it's the black swan trade in terms of its impact. If Again, if we look at correlations, they, they're just all wrong way in terms of U.S. rates uh, and what it imposes on all of these corollary assets, BTPs, JGBs, gilts, um, and then, of course, the dollar. Uh, that's Everything's wrong way correlated to the dollar as well. I would say if you're making the black swan trade on the risk-free asset itself, you're just going to be up against the Bank of England, right? At some point, these prices matter and they will react. And I think um, the central banks can overwhelm the market as they did yesterday. Um, and so I think you're, you're fighting a very difficult battle there because the, the worse things get, the more likely they are to respond. I think better to focus on the impact of higher rates. And I, and I think where we're trying to figure things out, we've got earnings season coming, uh, is how much of the mortgage payment shock, how does that reverberate through the U.S. economy? Uh, we're still printing record earnings. We're, we're very strong earnings. We still have a very tight labor market. Um, so the question is, how much of this ultimately translates into U.S. economic and thus corporate weakness? If that does occur, that's the next leg down. I think that's what you're supposed to play for and hedge against. Hey, Dean, awesome to get your thoughts this morning. Thank you, sir. Dean Kernett there of Macro Risk Advisors. Tom, I think it was Ed Yardani that said it recently. The bond vigilantes are back. He coined that term a number of decades yeah. ago, and they've made a comeback in the last few weeks, that's for sure. This is something we're going to cover. I don't want to do it right now, John. We've got to keep the show moving along. But, folks, the Bloomberg here really shows the vigilantiness of the moment, and we saw that in spades yesterday. And John, this is the naivete of politicians. They don't understand that the market, and critically, the market plumbing all of a sudden forces clarity and new decisions. Financial stability risk, front and center. On the S&P, we're down 1%. From New York City, Sebastian Page is coming up in the next hour of T. Rowe Price. Looking forward to that with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ian has been downgraded to a tropical storm after coming ashore in Florida with a deadly surge of water and catastrophic winds. When the damages are added up, it's expected to be one of the costliest storms in U.S. history. About 2.3 million homes are without power. The storm is forecast to move across central Florida and emerge over the Atlantic Ocean later today. It's expected to approach the coast of South Carolina on Friday and then move inland again. British Prime Minister Liz Truss is defending that package of tax cuts that sent markets into turmoil. Truss told local radio stations in the UK it's facing difficult economic times and the government had to take urgent action to get the economy growing. Despite the collapse of the pound and a surge in borrowing costs, Truss says she's confident the government has done the right thing. Porsche has gone public. Shares of the sports car maker began trading today after Europe's largest IPO in a decade. Parent Volkswagen raised more than $9 billion, pricing the stock at the top end of the initial range. It has clearly regulated that Porsche has 100% autonomy in future. The Porsche board will decide in future, completely independent from VW. And yeah, that's a great situation for us. We want to unlock Porsche's full potential, of course, but we have also the possibility in future to work together with the VW Group brands, where are beneficial for Porsche. The offering valued Porsche at $73 billion. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We have to buckle up our seatbelt even tighter. And we have to recognize that policymakers are no longer repressors of volatility, but they contribute to volatility. And that this journey is going to be incredibly bumpy. Mohammed Al Arian, just fantastic on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio yesterday of Queen's College, Cambridge. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, Tom Keane, Lisa Bramberts. Jonathan Farrow. Futures down almost one full percentage point on the S&P. When Turkey is commenting on your currency, you know you've got problems. Erdogan coming out and saying the British pound has blown up. This from a leader <coughs> of a country who said yesterday the central bank rate will have to fall further. <laughs> Tom, 
Just a bizarre situation at the moment. Yields elsewhere higher on a 10-year by 9 or 10 basis points. 10-year right. Treasury. Yields have been all over the place, Tom. I'll give you the range. Just let me give you the range on a 10-year Treasury, never mind the gilt market. 4%, the high yesterday, 4.01%. The low was 369 Tom, that's quite a range on a morning where we yeah. didn't really have any data. And I distilled this down to the real yield, which was a 1.60, comes back to 1.50. I thought Zero Hedge last night in the four-hour, John, did a great job of regaming the bet on what the Fed will do. And I think that's underreported this morning, John. There's been an adjustment in the market of what the trajectory of the Fed is. Hey, Tom, it's the conflict between tackling inflation <clears throat> and preventing financial stability risk. The Bank of England captured that perfectly yesterday, and that's what Mohammed addressed. Yeah. You've got a Bank of England on the one hand buying gilt to try and preserve financial stability, and on the other hand, it's set to raise interest rates, perhaps aggressively, over the next month or so, Tom. So which one wins out? Right. We digress right now as we have to. If you are a Red Sox fan and maybe you were ever so lucky like me, you saw Ted Williams on the backside of the career after his public service to the nation and not one but two wars. Anne-Marie Horton and a select group of Bloomberg surveillance community, including <laughs> Douglas Cass in Florida, are watching primetime with a kid from Fresno State. Anne-Marie, what was it like as someone that's followed this kid forever to see number 61 last night. For radio, I must note that Miss Horton is uh, wearing the Yankee garb this morning. <laughs> yeah, I had to wear this, Tom, just to troll you this morning because they're having an incredible season and everyone has just been waiting for him to hit this home run and he did it last yeah. night. He gave the ball to his mom. Uh, right. An incredible moment. It really, it really is an incredible moment. It's an and, incredibly and hard to do and he's able to do it. And Roger Maris's son was yes. also there. Yeah. So. I thought Roger Maris' son, after what I witnessed as a child, was a total class act. Should we see, to bring it over to your day gig, should we see <laughs> Mr. Judge greeted by the President of the United States? Oh, I would love to see that, wouldn't you? That would be amazing. I hope that in that case, would, John, our she Bloomberg would be news so colleagues would let would me be, go in for the John, Oval Office for that one. It would be so embarrassing. Hey, Tom, six foot seven, this guy's just a monster. I've watched him live a few times. Six foot seven, 282 pounds. And Tom, when he steps up to the plate, it is just phenomenal how big he actually is. It's, it's just ridiculous. The, it is the size, but it's also the mechanics and the grace of it uh, as well. I, I had the great privilege of the first time I saw him, I was literally two feet from the on-deck circle. And it's shocking, John, the grace that goes uh, with the size. We'll move on here as we look for number 62 <laughs> from Mr. Judge here in a moment. And Marie, I want to talk about the president. Greg Vallier wrote a painful note, painful note this morning on the state of a near 80-year-old president as well. This is delicate. These are delicate issues. How's the president doing? How does he get through each day? Well, it's getting really difficult, right, in the sense that there's a lot on the president's plate and they're gearing up for midterm elections, so the events keep coming in. There was obviously a delicate, as you say, but an embarrassing moment for the president yesterday when he was calling out a congresswoman, a late congresswoman's name, thinking she was in the room, and obviously she had passed away in a fatal car accident last month. And then the White House uh, way they spinned it was that this individual was just top of the president's mind. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, mistakes like this can happen. You don't know what was written in the teleprompter and the likes. But it does draw criticism to a president that when you also look in the polls, most Democrats are saying do not want him to lead them in the 2024 next presidential election. Right now, Anne-Marie, my focus is less on that political uh, back and forth and more on what's going on with uh, Florida. And the reason why is from a political standpoint with Ron DeSantis coming out and actually having to ask for aid from a president who he might run against and has been pretty uh, vitriolic against. And also this question of what to do at a time when we have massive population very much at the forefront of the hurricane risk. What's the message right now from the White House? Well, the White House is making clear that they are behind the leaders in Florida in terms of any of the funding, any of the support that they need. The president has been calling a number of mayors uh, throughout Florida and also has gotten on the phone with Governor DeSantis. And obviously, when you have natural disasters like this, 
for the most part, politics is put <clears throat> to the side, right? And this is about yeah. making sure that FEMA is in place. The president this afternoon at noon is going to be at FEMA headquarters. He's going to get an update on Hurricane Ian because right now, yes, it has been downgraded to a uh, tropical storm, but the damage it has done right. is incredibly destructive. And on top of that, at this moment, more than 2.5 million businesses and households are in the dark. So this is obviously going to be incredibly right. important for the president and how he handles this also can maybe impact, you know, one of these lasting moments before voters go to the polls. Right. Washington Post with a great chart on the population growth on the west coast of Florida over the last number of years. Anne-Marie, a viewer, a listener, the famous Bramo emails in. Bramo says, Judge looks good as a Met. I just want to make that clear. I mean... <laughs> also, we have to note, this guy is a team player. He wasn't swinging at everything over the past five or six games just to make sure he can oh, hit 61. John, he wanted to get... Yeah, he, he want, he's about winning. Right? I, I was getting messages every time he was stepping up to the plate, Tom, over the weekend. <laughs> just, from Anne-Marie. Just every single time. Just, put it on, put it on. Anne-Marie? <clears throat> If he's about winning, then it's good to go to the Mets because they're winning right now. Just saying, theoretically. Thank you, Thank you for waiting. I, I can, oh, I can see a rivalry emerging here between the two of you through the I rest of the season. I just can't get over Lisa, Upper West Side. <laughs> how does she become a Mets fan? Really? How, how did that happen? Do it's a long story. Not it. particularly. Not but mine, I no. will. But, you know, first of all, it's <clears> nice <throat> to root for the underdog, then see the underdog win. And people say, oh, you're just getting on the bandwagon mm -hmm. and saying, ha ha, I just won. There you go. Are we done? But please, done. let's be totally done. John, I mean, we've had like, so much football time for the last 10 years that you can have a little yeah, bit more baseball more time. Baseball. It's all right. Ramo. It's a lot going on. MH. Yeah. <laughs> down in DC. It was a delicate moment yesterday for the president, Tom. Really delicate. And then the yeah. press briefing with his, with his uh, press secretary. I have to say, that didn't go too well it, yesterday, it's TK. Really delicate. And just major kudos to Greg Vallier for raising the dialogue on such a delicate issue. Vallier's note this morning from AGF is just... Gentle, it's a legion. Futures right now down nine tenths of one percent on the SP. Carl Weinberg of High Frequency Economics joining us very shortly. Looking forward to that. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. from New York. Equities lower. We're down 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we are negative 1.36%. Big day of gains on Wednesday. We take some of it back this Thursday morning. In the bond market, all over the place. Wild couple of weeks in the bond market. Yields higher again by 10 or 11 basis points on a 10-year. 383.80 on twos up 8 to 421.50. Elsewhere, Sterling very much in focus. Liz Truss, the British Prime Minister, standing by and defending <coughs> her latest policy shift. Cable time back to 108.48, down about four tenths yeah. of 1%. On a technical basis, range bound, and we'll go with that. We'll have to see based on the news what, what happens this morning. Thanks to Mohammed El Arian just moments ago, bringing to my attention Renminbi appreciation this morning, maybe some form of ballet there as well. Right now, with the ballet outside the Bank of England in London, Lizzie Burden joins us. Lizzie, I think the British press is doing a much better job of this than the uh, global financial media. The prime minister needs to, quote, unquote, address the nation. How is she doing on that this morning on local radio? Well, I think it's Liz Truss's choice to go around the local broadcasters and speak to them. Some would argue that she's dodging the difficult questions from financial journalists. If she wants to speak to markets, she should come and talk to us. But at the same time, there's a lot of defence of local radio, and they do seem to be doing a pretty good job. Some of them, well, there was a, an interview in Leeds where she was asked how she slept last night. She was told all the things that have gone on in recent days. And then she was asked, where have you been? Uh, so they do seem to be doing a pretty good job of putting pressure on her. Her answer has been, uh, I believe in my tax cuts and we need to keep going with them. That is not going to reassure financial markets. Lizzie, do they understand why financial markets were whipsawed in the last couple of days? What are they blaming that on? I can't say whether the government understands it. Uh, I actually spoke to the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, at Labour Party conference earlier in the week, and she seemed to have a very clear understanding of 
the impact of the gilt markets on not only the government but ordinary people. Uh, but the, the whole point of this was the government thought that because it had a relatively low debt to GDP ratio, it could get away without scaring off the markets. But what the markets have objected to is, first of all, that these tax cuts are funded by borrowing, and secondly, that there was no fiscal uh, forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility alongside them. They do seem to have acknowledged that problem because now they've said, the Treasury has said, on November the 23rd, we will get that economic assessment. Lizzie, thank you. Lizzie Burden there from outside the Bank of England. <clears throat> I just wonder if they can all wait this long. November 23rd for the budget. November 3rd for the Bank of England. And Tom, we're not <clears throat> even in October yet. That month is going to be a very, well, I, very, I, very long month. I don't think they've got a month, John. How about a week? What are they going to sure. do in the next week, John? Well, the Bank of England's Simple operation that. they announced yesterday, Tom, only goes until the middle of October. I if, if we had this issue here, it's unthinkable that any given president would go out to local radio to begin to discuss this I when the you. nation flat us back. I find it, uh, I guess surreal is the right uh, word. Right now, and this is a joy as we continue to bring in, to gather in people, as John mentioned, Dr. L. Arian, Jens Nordvig with us yesterday. I thought Alan Ruskin was wonderful uh, with Deutsche Bank. Right now, Carl Weinberg. Chief Economist, High Frequency Economics, and far more out of the Lawrence Klein wing of the University of Pennsylvania with real world work in the rooms as these things get worked out. Carl, you nailed it this morning by saying, look, it's liquidation of bonds for cash. How will politicians respond to the threat of liquidation of bonds for cash? Well, I think, uh, good morning, Tom. Thank you. I'll try to live up to your introduction. Um, you know, what government can do is the government can give people a better reason to hold bonds, uh, a prospect for thinking that inflation will come down and that'll bring down bond yields, a prospect for thinking that the public finances are stabilized, that'll bring down bond yields, a prospect for thinking that once inflation is under control and growth will be able to resume, that'll bring down bond yields. But right now, we're not getting any of that in the UK. Um, at least not in the judgment of the markets, as we're plainly seeing. And uh, whether it's right, wrong, good, bad politics, it nonetheless seems to be uh, the markets reading it as bad economics. And how much is the Bank of England's response kind of the playbook for a lot of central banks going forward in terms of both hiking rates, keeping the front end high, and buying bonds to basically monetize a fiscal response, to monetize what the policymakers and government are going to be doing without completely upending the economy? Hi, good morning, Lisa. That's that's all the right questions, and um, it's hard to know what the answers are. The Bank of England has done a good job of convincing everybody that inflation is rampant. And whether I agree with that or not, all right, that's what the market believes, and that's what the market expects. So having convinced the public, having generated expectations in the public that there is a true inflation problem and that the right answer to that is hiking rates, the Bank of England really has no choice but to continue to deliver the remedy for the problem that it's defined and continue to raise interest rates. And it's going to have to raise that by a lot. If you look at their own inflation forecast, which, again, they aim to convince us are accurate forecasts, right? real interest rates are nowhere near real positive, all right, let alone high enough to break the economy. And now add to it the fiscal stimulus. They have to, in order to deliver the promise, in order to play out the scene that they have set, they have to deliver much higher interest rates. And it won't be until they do, I think, that the market will find an equilibrium price. Carl, have we reached the limits of deficit financing? Well, certainly in the case of the UK, we have to say that the market isn't buying what the government is selling in terms of uh, the amount of debt that it believes it can finance at this time. You know, in the longer term, you know, we're all dead, of course, but in the longer term, we can probably borrow a lot more than we are right now. But to amp up the game at such a rapid pace under these current circumstances, which is to say in opposition to the stated policy goals of the central bank, ignoring, if you will, the advice of the central bank governor and his committee and his economists and his analysis, all right, and going ahead and ramping up spending anyhow, that seems to be a move right. that pushed beyond credibility. Carl Weinberg, September 1982, and of course, Daniel Jurgen wrote this up beautifully in Commanding Heights. You were at the Bank of Montreal doing debt workouts on disasters in Latin America. What does Trussonomics 2 look like? How do they get from what everybody believes is a theoretical train wreck to whatever the outcome is? How do you get to Reaganomics 2? How do you get to Trussonomics 2? 
Well, Tom, as I'm sure you've mentioned many times over the last couple of days, the Reagan administration cut taxes like mad and ran up the federal deficit like mad in the early days of its uh, administration. But by the time we got to the end, they were raising taxes to pay for it. And uh, all of the promises of uh, supply side economics and voodoo economics or whatever you chose to call it didn't seem to work out. So I suspect that someday there will be a day of reckoning in the UK where they will have to unwind some of this. But it's pretty clear from the prime minister's statement that that's not going to happen this week or next week or the month even after. Okay, that. I'm going to keep. We got to continue this. John Farrow, jump in here. You're the guy from Britain as well. What does the 1922 committee do under your odd government in Britain? Well, I think the market's going to dictate that, Tom, potentially over the next few weeks. And Carlos, right, for the next few weeks at least. I think a lot of people don't see Liz Truss changing her mind. At the moment, Carl, this operation from the Bank of England goes until the middle of October. The concept we're all talking about now, Carl, is fiscal dominance. Walk us through that concept, Carl, and how well you think this Bank of England can push back against it. Well, the Bank of England, John, as you know, has unlimited resources. It can raise interest rates to a million percent if it wants to, to achieve its goals. It said what it wants to do. It said how it's going to do it. And I don't think it can or will back down. Um, on terms of the government, the government has limited fiscal resources if it gets into a, a battle with the Bank of England over whether the economy should be stimulated or not. not. The Bank of England will win this. It's a question at what interest rate do we have to get there? The risk, the big risk, and John, I know you're conscious of this very much more so than I am, is that the government gets fed up with the Bank of England and starts to restrict its independence. Yep. On that day, sterling will go down the tubes, and on that day, gilt yields will soar to levels that I dare not even contemplate. There was a whisper of that in August, and they tried to address it as soon as they took over. Carl, fantastic to hear from you, sir, as always. Carl Weinberg there of High Frequency Economics. There is conflict across the board. There is conflict between the Federal Reserve and the rest of the world as everyone tries to grapple with the FX market and try and achieve a stronger currency. There is conflict within the United Kingdom, within the UK, between fiscal policy and monetary policy. And as Mohammed pointed out in the last 24 hours, there is now conflict within the central bank as they try and achieve financial stability and bring down inflation at the same time. And Tom, that's the thing we've got to sit on just a little bit more. How do you preserve financial stability coming into the gilt market and buying bonds and at the same time address inflation, hike interest rates by potentially 100 basis points? That one I can't reconcile. What Alan Meltzer would say, and this conundrum has been there, John, since the advent, let's call it 1907, 1912, Fed central banking. But the conundrum here is real simple. Time is the friend of policymakers. And as Weinberg predicted for Greece, he was two years out front uh, with a lot of other people, John, as well. I think, John, you worked at that out as well as Dr. Weinberg. But the bottom line is time is your friend. And Truss in, has to understand that her solution to her winnable policy is to extend the x-axis out. That's not what we're seeing now. Here, it's all at once. To wait. To and wait. And Tom, I think you're not, you're not alone saying that, Tom. Yeah. A lot of people have said that, that perhaps this policy might have been the right policy in maybe nine months' time, ten months' time. But right now, what was, no. it, what was the word that Guy used yesterday? Febrile markets. Talks about maybe this was the wrong time to yeah, use it given the market backdrop. Yeah, that's a word. I, I don't understand what that means. You know, I, don't, I can't keep up with Guy. I can't keep up you with know? Guy either. He's fantastic. He's posh. I try and keep up. He's posh. He's posher than I am, that's for sure. Very posh. I'm look, what do you see on the screen, John? I mean, seriously, here, folks, we're in, a, we're in the middle of a crisis. It's Wednesday. we got claims coming up uh, tomorrow, some economic data today. And, John, I still got to go back to the litmus paper of the system. Sterling has not broken out the sterling strength at 108 level. You're just still all over the place. And, Lisa, you started the program talking about this. You've got global core, core government bond markets trading like crypto. <laughs> Actually, trading worse than crypto. It's what we learned earlier from this Dean morning. Kernet, yeah. From Dean Kernet, yeah. From Dean Futures down 1%, live from New York on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. One of the strongest hurricanes ever to hit the U.S. has now been downgraded to a tropical storm. Ian has devastated parts of Florida, flooding homes and knocking out power to more than 2 million people. It's expected to be one of the costliest storms ever, causing more than $67 billion in damages and economic losses. The storm is forecast to move across central Florida and emerge over the Atlantic Ocean later today. 
The U.S. is now seeking ways to encourage British Prime Minister Liz Truss's team to dial back those dramatic tax cuts. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. Treasury Department is concerned about the volatility in the financial markets. It's working through the IMF to put the pressure on the British government. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is pushing ahead with the annexation of the parts of Ukraine that its troops control after sham elections. And that puts the Kremlin on another collision course with the U.S. and its allies. Russia will sign treaties to absorb the four regions at a ceremony on Friday. Retired Super Bowl quarterback Eli Manning has scored his first private equity deal. The firm where he's a partner, Brand Velocity Group, has acquired a majority stake in youth sports league apparel company Score Sports. A group of current and former pro athletes also invested. Bloomberg's learned the transaction values the business at about $145 million. And in baseball, Aaron Judge of the New York Yankees hit his 61st home run Wednesday night. That tied the American League record set by Yankees Roger Maris in 1961. Judge's success could help him negotiate a new contract when he becomes a free agent after this season. He reportedly turned down a seven-year, $213 million offer from the Yankees. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The Fed was aware and is aware of the contagion effect of monetary policy. But again, that won't be enough to deter this Federal Reserve from their current pathway as their focus is reigning in inflation and reinstating the bedrock of the economy, which is price stability. Until something cracks, perhaps. Lindsay Piexa, chief economist at Stiefel, live from New York. This is Bloomberg. Equities are lower by eight or nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down by 1.2 percent. Yields are higher by nine basis points on a 10-year, 3.82. <clears throat> 18 for those of you interested in where the gilt market is trading, which seems to be how, how we're playing it? this at the moment. Yeah, how is it? Seriously? I can tell you at the front end, it's up 20 basis points on a two year. At the long end, we're okay. down a couple of basis points. We are all over the shop. Tom, there is a clear split in the gilt market right now. If you look from twos out to fifties, between thirties and up. So twos to tens, a softer yield higher, and then all the stuff that the central bank is buying in the gilt market operation, which is the longer stuff, right. the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, pretty stable. That's the split. Yeah. It's pretty clear on my screen right now. We'll continue to monitor this and, of course, off of our credit desk in London as well. John, quickly, surveillance correction. John, senior moment. I mean, we're, you know, President Biden's have some challenges as well, so is President Keene. <laughs> surveillance correction. Sure. I thought it was Wednesday the whole day. Oh, did you? <laughs> I spent, do you, feel, the whole do you feel happier now? You know it's, yeah. it's Thursday. Yeah, we've got uh, an American Indian in our control room, Treon House, and she said to me gently that that Treon House said, Tom, it's Thursday. It is Thursday, so Tom. I nailed St it. Still September. Claims coming up here in less than two hours, and they will be important. This is an honor. She is Ukrainian, and that means something different when you're at the Atlantic Council. As Deputy Director of European Inter Energy Security, Olga Kokova uh, joins us with bulletproof effort on environmental pipeline work. She is definitive out of the University of Kansas. Olga, honored to have you uh, with us this morning. There's this pipeline. There's that pipeline. Can Russia go out right now and blow up any damn pipeline they want to? Well, hopefully not. And every effort right now, all the energies at NATO level, U.S., EU, wider European cooperation is being focused to make sure that that does not happen. Greater visibility on what those threats are, both kinetic and cyber, because both are at risk right now. Having a clear assessment of what's happening with the critical infrastructure, identifying exactly what that critical infrastructure is and what's more or less likely to be attacked. That is exactly what the allies are focusing on right now. What's going on? Why would Russia, we were talking about this before coming on, why would Russia sabotage the Nord Stream 1 pipeline? It's unclear if they did. We haven't gotten that confirmed. There were right. hints of that from authorities. And then we had some ambiguous uh, comment out of the Kremlin today saying that it could be state terrorism. What's going on? Right. Uh, Definitively, we do not know for 100% that this was Russia, but everything is pointing to Russia. And initially, when I first saw the headlines, I, I had to take a few seconds and think, why would Russia destroy its own 
billions of dollars worth of infrastructure when on the other hand, it is pushing to have more gas flowing through Nord Stream 1, through Nord Stream 2, through reducing sanctions. But if you look at the bigger picture right now, nothing is moving through Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. So they're not really losing any income on the gas moving through the pipelines. Uh, Russia is also creating this market uncertainty and once again, spiking up prices just when the prices started to come down uh, as Europe was filling up its storage. And it was, I mean, it's getting up to 90 plus percent across a lot of the countries. So there was, you know, the market was slowly easing into the winter. Now, it was still going to be a rough winter, but the prices started to level down. Now, with this recent, these recent explosions, we're seeing the prices going back up. And we're, and this is not because of the supply crunch. Once again, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2 did not have any gas flowing through it. So, it, and, and Russia can still increase flows through Yamal and other Ukrainian pipeline networks, as well as through Turkey. So the alternative is there. And the reason the markets are reacting the way they are is because to what you asked earlier, is that risk on critical energy infrastructure across Europe. One of the hardest, places, one, of the, one of the hardest equations right now, Olga, is extrapolating the energy story into the economic story in terms of how much slowdown there's going to be. Germany's network regulator uh, today came out and said that gas demand was well above last week. Temperatures have been dropping. You're starting to see the winter effect come into play, and that there needs to be savings of 20 percent to avoid uh, some sort of shortage this winter. What does that look like? How much have people really accounted for the slowdown of idling factories and un? heated stores in order to save that energy. Right, and a lot more will have to be done. Uh, so just to reiterate, the storage you know, being full is one of those things that's going to make sure that people will be okay. People are not going to freeze to death. But going back to your question on the economic impacts, that's still going to be extremely tough on a lot of the industries that are carbon intensive and are utilizing natural gas to, to produce whatever they're making, whether uh, whether it's uh, – and, and Germany, it, most of its economy is heavily – reliant on, on their industry production. So further cuts will need to be done. Sacrifices such as, you know, putting your thermostat at a level that you may not be comfortable at. But once again, looking into what can you weatherize in the next couple of months to ease into that. Now, Germany also has quite a few five FSRUs coming in online in the next couple of months and also in the next year or, or so. So they are looking into alternative options, alternative supplies. Uh, but there's only so many options and what can be done in the next couple of months, and it will be tough, and it will be extremely tough on, on the economy. Olga, thank you. A difficult winter ahead. don't know how many times I've said that already. Olga Kukova there of the Atlantic Council, and it's not winter yet. CPI out of Germany. We had the regional breakdown a little bit earlier this morning. The numbers, Lisa, not pretty. In some regions, double-digit inflation in Germany again. I believe the headline number comes out in about an hour's time, and we could see a big number there too. Yeah, some people extrapolating out a 10% figure, which would be the biggest in data going imagine? back to the 1990s. No, I can't. This is a country that has really structured itself around not having inflation. And they're facing inflation of the absolute worst kind through commodities, through slowing growth. How do you deal with that? I mean, honestly, I, this is going to be a, just a game changer when you're talking about electric blankets flying off the shelves because that's how people are preparing for a winter that's going to be really tough. The theme of the last 24 hours, and the UK has experienced it, is the difficulty addressing inflation and preserving financial stability. Tom, if we get double-digit CPI out of Germany, you're going to have a monster well, push to do more. We heard from one ECB <coughs> official yeah. earlier this morning to do something about QT. At the same time, we've got an Italian 10-year just short of 470. It's really important, John. Lisa nailed this early in the show uh, this morning. This is something not only in Germany, but frankly in the United States, folks, is if we get inflation not giving way, particularly core CPI in America, Germany, here in what, John, an hour and five minutes, I mean, that's just another indicator of the front loading that's required right now. Yields up in Germany, and inflation could well be up as well. We'll give it, bring you that number in about 60 minutes' time. I'm going to catch up with Sebastian Page in just a moment, the CIO and head of global multi-asset at T. Rowe Price. Looking forward to catching up with him. Futures right now off the lows, down 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down by a little more than 1%. A 10-year yield that is higher by 8 or 9 basis points again on a 10-year 381.78. Lisa, we've talked a lot about that range, haven't we? <laughs> that range has been huge in the last 24 hours. Not quite guilt-esque. I, I, I'll admit that, but still on a 10-year, pretty impressive. Yeah, but guilt-esque means more volatile than Bitcoin, as Dean Kernett said. Nuts. So, I mean, this is a this is a pretty pretty high bar there for in terms of volatility. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
think the Bank of England's been backed to some extent into a corner by unorthodox fiscal policies. The BOE really needs to keep a hawkish eye on inflation and in controlling inflation. Markets aren't stable, inflation changes everything, and government central banks are going to try all kinds of things. Global markets moving 20, 30, 50 basis points off of one data point. I think that in and of itself is an indication of dysfunction. Today, we seem, you know, the economics of pandemonium. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What happens when the bond market is trading like a penny stock? From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, live on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down nine-tenths of 1% on the S&P. TK, this bond market in the last 24 hours, all over the place. This is an historic moment. I really want to emphasize, John, it continues today. More nuanced, maybe not the fire that was uh, evident yesterday, uh, Wednesday or Tuesday as well. But, uh, John, there is some real tension in the market, but I would link it over to everyone hanging on every two and three word syllable word from the prime minister. From the prime minister and the governor, perhaps, of the Bank of England. November is a long, long way oh. away. November is a <laughs> long way away. We've got to wait for a budget in November, got to wait for a Bank of I, England decision in November. My question, Tom, would be, do we have to wait for those two things? I, I would say not. And what, what I see, and if folks, I don't want to do the inside baseball here at the top of the hour. We've got a lot to accomplish. Uh, but I would say, John, that I would watch inflation-adjusted yields and I would watch what Lisa watches, the spread market is the almost thermometer of the belief in what Jerome Powell would do. Lisa, the conflict is there for all to see. And right now, the conflict is also in the hidden leverage that's been built up around markets that were considered risk-free. And you asked earlier this morning, John, how much is this a problem that we're seeing the risk in risk-free assets? And I would argue a massive problem. That is what is the cause of financial crises because of things like pension funds that have sort of hidden leverage to the longer end of the curve in the United Kingdom. Nuts. How many bailouts can you actually achieve given some of these structural issues? See up the critical question. Mohammed Al Ariana asked that question for us in the last 24 hours. Can you tackle inflation and address financial stability simultaneously? Had a flavor of this from the ECB earlier in the summer. Now we're seeing it play out in the UK. Can you? It's really tough without cooperation from the physical world. If you don't get a cooperation in some sort of year over year comparison in inflation, if you don't understand the root cause, it becomes a serious challenge. In other words, can central banks continue to hike the front end while buying bonds, while engaging in mass quantitative easing programs, essentially, on the back end, tightening and easing? We're going to at Japan. At the same time. At this the same is, time. Yeah, this is I, Japanification in a new way. It's crazy stuff. Equities this morning. Good morning to you. We are lower by nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by one point two percent. Yields are higher again by nine basis points. Three eighty two thirty eight dollars showing a little bit of strength later against the euro. Euro dollar ninety seven thirteen. And right now what we're seeing is intervention on a global scale, unlike what we have seen for decades. And it comes on the heels of inflation that we have not seen for decades. 8 a.m. We get the latest read on that German CPI coming out. The expectation is it could be 10 percent on average, a record. How do you deal with a nation who has not seen this since World War II? This type of inflation, the whole structure of the economy was built around avoiding this, not spending too much, and now spending more to try to stave off some of the pain of high energy prices. The conundrum is felt around the world. 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. initial jobless claims, as well as the a third read on GDP annualized personal consumption, core PCE for the second quarter as well. Tom, you were talking about claims Thursday. How much do we actually get an accurate read on the labor market? And what you're hearing more from some of the reports from economists is looking under the hood and seeing weakness, yeah. more households that are taking on more jobs, companies that aren't necessarily hiring as much, just shutting out some of those openings or possibly reducing the hours of different employees. This is a different and nuanced picture that's moving very quickly. And we can get possibly yeah. the underpinnings of that with some earnings with Bed Bath & Beyond at 7.30 a.m. in about a half an hour time. Nike right. after the bell, the retailers and Micron Tech technology really speaking to some of the fall off in demand for chips. I would take it and push it aside. The financial stability questions now have just they're rendered supreme on this Thursday. I'm with you, Tom. Oh, Lisa is too. I think we're all on the same page yeah, on this in a, in a major, major way. Yeah. Lisa, thank you. Sebastian Page joins us now, CIO and head of global multi-asset at T. Rowe Price. Seb, let's start there. Can you address inflation 
and preserve financial stability at the same time. Jonathan, it's very hard. It's like having a foot on the brake and a foot on the accelerator. Think about what's going on in the UK. You're printing money by buying long-end bonds while you're tightening interest rates. The problem, and you've hit the nail on the head already, is financial stability. And look, it, one, one of our analysts sent me overnight uh, an analysis that suggested that if the BOE hadn't started buying those 30-year gilts, uh, about 90 percent of LDI, liability-driven investing pension managers, you know, would have run out of collateral. So we're, we're really talking about financial stability here. And everyone's criticizing this foot on the brake, foot on the accelerator. It doesn't make sense. It's crazy macro policy. But at some point, Jonathan, I think the takeaway is it, 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 it's not whether it can make it work or not. It's you have to do right. it. You have no choice. Sebastian, out three years. T. Rowe Price, five years is short term. We all know that. Does this imply that central banks will blink, that we will impute a permanent inflation into the system, which will give us a better revenue stream, which means equities become more attractive? Not quite yet. And again, we're still trying to tighten monetary conditions. I don't think that this forces a Fed pivot anytime soon. But uh, you'll have to try to do both, Tom. And I do think that the stickiness of inflation is going to persist. I've been coming on your show for a while now this year saying, you know, we're underweight stocks. We're, we're getting there. We're going to start buying soon because we like to be contrarian, but just not quite yet. And today I'm still saying just not quite yet. And part of it is the last inflation print in the U.S., 0.6% month over month in the core CPI with uh, increases in rents and housing. And so it's really sticky. Now, the craziest number in capital markets to me is the one year break even, right? It's actually below 2%. Now, my friends who are economists tell me, don't look at the break even as inflation expectations. It's technical. It has a risk premium component and so on. But look, one of our asset allocation committee members said at our last meeting, that if we print 2% year-over-year inflation 12 months from now, they're going to eat their hat in our committee meeting. So that number, that one-year break-even, looks out of place to me. Tom, short answer, inflation is going to be sticky, and I think we are in a new yep. world for inflation. Sebastian, bear with me with some mental gymnastics, but I'm trying to do some mental gymnastics with the idea of buying bonds and raising rates at the front end. But doesn't the unwillingness to allow the market to crash, to allow financial stability to unravel, prolong inflation by monetizing a nation's debt? Yes, I think it does. But again, you have very little choice. And this is sort of the third leg of the risk in financial markets that we are just starting to see. And you've ta been talking about it on the show today. You're just starting to see it, right? We've had the rate shock and the repricing of stocks, and stocks are down 20%. Everyone's worried about the growth shock, in which case, by the way, long end government bonds should do okay. They should be a hedge for a growth shock, not for a rate shock, but for a growth shock. And the third leg, which we're all worried about right now, and maybe that's why we're not leaning in right now to go back to neutral on stocks versus bonds, is the financial stability, the plumbing. And think about the COVID experience in March 2020. Authorities, the Fed, you had no choice but to get in and solve the plumbing issue because we're talking about systemic risks. So, yes, I think it will overall make the fight against inflation much more difficult. And it will also mean that um, over time, the tightening is going to have to be persistent, at least for the, la for the next 12 months. So it's, you know, it's everyone's bearish, Lisa. Everyone's come around to your view, right? <laughs> and look, I, I, th I, I think it's very hard to make a bullish case right now. I, I, I played devil's advocate with our asset allocation committee, yep. and I basically showed data that doesn't look at all like pre-recession, year-over-year consumption in nominal terms earnings surprises, leverage much lower, PMI levels are actually still above 50. So if you compare those data to March 01 and December 07, you're not, you're not in pre-recession level. But again, everything else is just so bearish and the financial stability is becoming an issue. So it, these are treacherous markets. Sebastian, I'm Lisa's agent and she does consultancy if you want someone to play <laughs> devil's advocate on the, on the committee.
if you've got a spare chair. <laughs> you mean because that's but, what but I do it's, by it's profession. A big, it's a big rate. I'll tell you that. Sebastian Page, well, T-Row Price. Go on, Seb, a, just finally, quickly. You take <laughs> Go on, Seb. Thank you. Well, you know, the devil's advocates are really hard to find on the bullish side right now. I think even Laidler and Kalanovic, you, you have them on your show. <laughs> they're, they're, struggling, they're struggling to make a strong bullish case right now, right? <laughs> but at some point, this is price. It is the most anticipated recession in history, in my mind. I'm not sure Lisa's the right candidate for the bullish side. I actually you wanna, you wanna read play something. The bullish side? There read was something there bullish. was a bullish uh, commentary out, not just from Marco Kalanovic, but saying basically that we've had such a washout of sentiment that it's starting to look like a lot of the bad news has been priced in. But that's as good as you can get in terms of optimism. The Fed pivot is the thing they're all excited about on the bullish side. The struggle I have with that, Lisa, if they're pivoting because of recession, and by pivot I mean pause, because of recession or financial stability risk, is that bullish? I don't know if it's, that's bullish. Forgive me for the second and third derivative here. Sure. But what that means is longer term inflation. Oh, exactly. What that means is rates higher for longer. What that means is the long end having trouble staying moored because that ends up with them not seriously fighting that issue. This is not an easy or comfortable situation for risk assets. Futures down eight or nine tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by a little more than 1%. Yields are higher by nine or 10 basis points. Just getting information from the White House, the president approving a Florida disaster declaration. We'll bring you the latest from down in Florida very shortly. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, Ian has been downgraded to a tropical storm. After coming ashore in Florida with a deadly surge of water and catastrophic winds, when the damages are added up, it's expected to be one of the costliest storms in U.S. history. About 2.3 million homes are without power, and the storm is forecast to move across central Florida and emerge over the Atlantic Ocean later today. It's expected to approach the coast of South Carolina on Friday and then move inland once again. British Prime Minister Liz Truss is defending that package of tax cuts that set markets into turmoil. Truss told local radio stations in the UK that the UK is facing difficult economic times and the government had to take urgent action to get the economy growing. Despite the collapse of the pound and a surge in borrowing costs, Truss says she's confident the government has done the right thing. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is pushing ahead with the annexation of parts of Ukraine that its troops control after sham elections. That puts the Kremlin on another collision course with the U.S. and its allies. Russia will sign treaties to absorb the four regions at a ceremony on Friday. And OPEC Plus has started talking about cutting oil output when it meets next week. According to a delegate, the size of the potential cut is still under consideration. The fragile global economy continues to put pressure on oil prices. At its latest meeting, OPEC Plus showed its readiness to stabilize markets by making a symbolic cut. And Porsche has gone public. Shares of the sports car maker began trading today after Europe's largest IPO in a decade. Parent Volkswagen raised more than $9 billion, pricing the stock at the top end of the initial range. The offering valued Porsche at $73 billion. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The federal funds rate next year would increase to uh, four and a half to four and three quarters. I think it's pretty clear that everybody has in mind a continued increase until we get to that point. I'd say like March 2023 will be at that point. We'll see. I think Tom's been saying it a million times. OBE overtaken by events. Charles Evans there, the Chicago Fed president, at an event hosted by the London School of Economics. Futures right now down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. Just about off session lows on the Nasdaq 100 down nine tenths of one percent. Again, yields higher by eight or nine basis points. 382 on a 10-year. I want to check in on the gilt market for you just briefly. I'll bring that up on my Bloomberg terminal. It's amazing to see the split in the gilt market <coughs> at the moment. So basically, the Bank of England has this gilt operation now daily going out to the middle of October. And when you look at gilts, what you'll notice is that 30-year plus is trading firmer with yields lower 
and then everything else, tens down to twos, right. is softer with yields higher. Now, Tom, that's because all the stuff from twos to tens is the stuff that the Bank of England is not buying at the moment in that guilt operation they announced yesterday. What do we learn from trust this morning, John? I mean, Lizzie Burden not was... Not much, bank, Tom. But the answer's not much, right? It's, and in, there's some information in there. I like that. It's, it's, so no change. It's, it's not much Thursday. Is that what we're calling it? No change. Yeah, no change. We're modernist yeah. folks in the litmus paper. is sterling 108.75. I'm going to call that technically range-bound uh, right now. On the lawn at the White House, Anne-Marie Horton joins us, Bloomberg, Washington uh, correspondent. Anne-Marie, there is a hurricane... George Bush Jr. never recovered from a hurricane. Every politician. Give us the tension between the president of the United States and the governor of Florida. They're on the phone on this natural disaster. And other than that, they have nothing in common. They have absolutely nothing in common, and it's not lost on anyone that these two could even go face-to-face, -face, potentially, in a 2024 presidential election. So obviously things are tense. There's not been the nicest of words or politics towards the two of them, but they've put that aside in what is going on in Florida. You have overnight the president declaring uh, this disaster. He's unlocking these federal funds for loans, for housing, for anything that the state needs. And even yesterday, he was at an event last night, but he did start off talking about the fact that he wanted to give an update about what's going on in the hurricane. He wants to make sure that and we've seen a number of these readouts. He's on the phone with mayors. If they're not picking up, he's leaving messages. That's one of what one of the readouts said. And then this afternoon, he'll be getting a brief on exactly the damage that was done. And that's at noon with, uh, with FEMA. Do you have any sense in your reporting of a federal policy to end lots and lots of development amid areas where there can be a natural disaster? whether it's a volcano or a hurricane, whatever. I don't detect a policy, do you? No, I don't. And I'm not sure that actually would work for politicians, right? Especially when they're trying to talk about bringing back jobs and investment and building new homes, uh, if that would actually work. But it does bring up a very good point, right? Because you have a number of these cities just absolutely flooded uh, in Florida and the way the world is going, what scientists say is that we could and should expect more of extreme natural disasters due to climate change. And Marie, this ties back to the conversation that we've been having overcome by events, as Tom's been saying, the idea that nations have to actually be spending some real money to counteract real things at a time where money is much more expensive. How much can the United States spend the 70 billion some odd dollars that some people are estimating the damage to cost to repair and still keep the rest of its budget because right now it's not so easy just to expand and borrow more. It's a great question because also at the same time you have a number of legislation that's come in over the summer that is going to be towards putting money towards investment whether or not it was the hard inflation reduction act last uh, last summer or this summer, money going towards uh, clean energy? Uh, it's a great question, but I think when it comes to things like natural disaster, you'll hear from politicians, you'll hear from this White House that they will do whatever it takes, in essence, to make sure that they can help uh, people rebuild. Uh, but we do know, and we've seen that for years after Hurricane Katrina, people were still struggling to get back on their feet and get their homes rebuilt. Anne-Marie, we appreciate the coverage. AMH down in D.C. She's going to keep us up to speed on this as the news continues to come in down in Florida. For everyone down there, we hope you're doing well. And stay safe, Tom, because as you know, things are difficult at the moment. And it takes a long time. It can take a few days, take a week for the damage to really reveal oh, itself in uh, places I, like this. This is far worse than what I personally witnessed. Oh, I can't remember, John, 1990-whatever hurricane. Uh, Bob, and I, I, this is not weeks, it's months, John. It's, it's out. There is a fiscal impulse to rebuilding. There's no question about that. But far beyond that is just the permanent damage and particularly the damage, not to the fancy people that we talk to every day, but to, to people just making a go of it in the middle class of America.
Yeah, right now we need to talk about the markets too. Tom, we're going to come back to that story through this morning, of course, on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Stocks at the moment down about six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down nine tenths of one percent. <coughs> Talked a lot about the bond market. Yield time by eight basis points on a ten-year, 381.17. Talked a lot about the gilt market too. And Lisa, I'll keep bringing this up. Just the divide, the split in the gilt market between what the Bank of England is buying and and what it isn't buying at the moment in that gilt operation they announced yesterday. How much is this operation save the housing market, operation save pensions? This is operation try to preserve a lid on just full chaos being unleashed in the UK market. A lot of people have been writing notes about how the UK is a front runner, not necessarily an outlier with respect to the conundrum of trying to deal with fiscal policies that can no longer be expansive purely on deficit spending alone. I don't know if you save the housing market with this. That's right, because ultimately, it's short term. Ultimately, rates are going to go up, Lisa. My question would be how much. <clears throat> I asked Mohammed that question yesterday, and he said 100 basis points, basically baseline, and perhaps even more. And you've pointed this out, that the mortgage market is much more short term in the United Kingdom, and so it will go up more directly and more immediately with rate hikes. That said, then what, what point does that become a financial stability problem? If you get a housing market crash that's dramatic, well, then what has the Bank of England really addressed that? And that goes to the question that Mohammed Alarian was asking. Are these two issues, these two goals, contradictory of both suppressing inflation and preventing some sort of systemic crash? Oh, they're totally in conflict right now. Yeah. And not just in the UK. Tom, in Europe too. And really that's where it started well, with the ECB talking about raising interest rates and then also talking about containing spreads in places like Italy. Yeah, but I'm, within the nuance of the geographies, including everything going in the Pacific Rim, I would point out that they're still at war in Europe. I mean, that's the heart of the matter is sure. forget about the econ mumbo jumbo. There's a war going on. Energy supply. Yeah. Energy supply, top of mind, going through winter. For the Europeans, equities down six tenths of one percent, yields up eight basis points, three eighty one from New York. Jeff Curry at Goldman mm. coming up very shortly. This is Bloomberg. <music> Live from New York City. Yet it's not over. Got three more months of it, a whole quarter and a couple of days. Equities down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. It's been a long one, hasn't it, Lisa? That's for sure. The Nasdaq down about nine tenths of one percent. The Russell of small caps down six tenths of one percent. If I tell you where stocks are, you can guess where the bond market is. This is where the bond market is. Yields on a ten-year higher by eight basis points, three eighty-one. Still twenty basis points south of where we were yesterday at the highs. Gives you an idea of the, the uh, range of the last twenty-four hours. The two-year four eighteen. Let's call it four twenty. Yield tied by five basis points. Just wanted to reveal the split in the gilt market that's emerging here today, this morning. So the gilt market operation the Bank of England announced yesterday is basically to buy bonds with a maturity of more than twenty years on a secondary market. So what you're seeing today in the gilt market is everything 20 years plus. So let's take the 30 year, the 50 year yields are a little bit lower. Everything the Bank of England's not touching in this gilt market operation yields a higher Tom. So look at this divide. We've got a 10 year up 15 basis points, a two year up 20. And we're just pinning down the longer end of the bond market because the BOE is going to be in here for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, this is really, really important. I don't want to do the chart here. It's too important to get to Mr. Curry. But, but John, um, I, all I can say here is the persistency of trend gave confidence to own that 30-year paper and it was blown up by the Prime Minister. In a big, big way. And we're looking to see if we get some more comments from the government today. Lisa, I know you want to do some single names. Can we just get you the numbers for Bed Bath & Beyond? Please. Because you talked about that a little bit earlier. Net sales down 28% year over year. The adjusted loss per share is 322. The estimate was 158. Wow. I'll keep going through the headlines, but the stock moves pretty obvious. Yeah, it's going to be down. And if you want to bring it up, we could take a look at that right now. Bed Bath & Beyond, a fascinating display of is this just an execution issue? Is this a retail getting really squeezed or something of both? But what I'm noticing is that sometimes the earnings projections are getting downgraded at a faster clip even than people have expected, even though they have been coming fast and furious. We'll keep a look at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. After the bell, we're going to be watching Micron. And the reason why this is particularly interesting is is because this gives a bellwether view into the semiconductor field as well as 
into Apple, in some of the big tech companies that are manufacturing uh, products that use these chips. We're looking at a lot of the major semiconductor producers from Intel to AMD uh, to Micron all down some 40 to 50 percent so far year to date. Apple is only down only, I should say, uh, about 14 percent year to date. If you take a look uh, going back or uh, at some point, it's down a bit more. But right now, how much do we have more weakness, Tom, to price in at a time when you're looking at just some dramatic revisions downward by the semiconductors? We'll have to see on that. After a big day, Dow up over 500 points, SPX with a launch to 3,700 SPX, and Dow off the 28,000 shock to 29,600. Right now, the microeconomist from the University of Chicago, Jeffrey Curry, holds court at Goldman Sachs as global head of commodity research. Jeff, love your note where you really go into the price theory off the dollar of your commodity space. You have something that I would suggest 104% of our listeners and viewers don't understand. Commodities, year-to-date, in Japan, up 51%. Year-to-date, in the United States, up 22%. The dollar matters, doesn't it? Absolutely. That's why we titled the piece um, Dollar Dominance. Um, and the, the main point there is as the U.S. hikes interest rates faster than the rest of the world, you get a divergence in global interest rates, um, which then in turn puts upward pressure on the dollar, so funding costs in dollar increase, and then people deleverage dollar-denominated assets, and commodities are one. I don't care if it's a financially held one or a physically held one. You'd rather liquidate that and hold cash paying 5% than take the risk of that. And then what happens? Deflation sets in in dollar-denominated assets. That deflation then increases real U.S. incomes, which then puts more upward pressure on interest <clears throat> rates. And so it's a vicious right. <clears throat> negative feedback loop. Take us to supply and demand then, and I guess we could go to the next OPEC meeting if we really wanted to, but do you throw general equilibrium study of oil out the window because of this excess dollar move? Really good question, and it keeps me up at night. And like, here's the way I'm thinking about it is, Let's go to the definition of um, inflation. Too much money chasing too few goods. So you have two conditions to get inflation. Too much money and too few goods. We still have too few goods. The oil market is in a deficit. Inventories are low. But what's happening? Money supply is shrinking. And so that's taking the price level and driving it down, even though you still have too few goods. So. You know, we look at the fundamental picture. Our base case is it's going to continue to tighten as we go into year end. And particularly, you take out the SPR barrels, um, you get stabilization in, in China, the oil to gas substitution in Europe. Um, this market's going to get tighter and tighter as we go into the winter months. Um, so if we, we need to see some stability in money supply or in the dollar in terms of thinking about that liquidity issue, then those fundamentals can press higher. But I think right now you need to really separate what's happening on the money supply side and what's happening on the fundamental supply and demand side. One aspect of the story, Jeff, that's gotten a bit lost in the recent turmoil, turmoil and worry about a recession is possible capacity to produce. Uh, and there was a story out today talking about how OPEC Plus may actually cut its uh, production at its next meeting. How much do you expect something like that, not necessarily in response to the price going down, but in response to a lack of capacity to continue to produce at levels that they're doing now? Well, I mean, if, if they're data dependent, if they're going to cut production, they're doing it because they look at the market being in a surplus and that's what makes sense. But in terms of thinking about the overall capacity, that should affect longer term prices, which is one of the reasons why we're bullish long dated long term oil prices. We can, you're out of capacity, which means you have to forward invest. And ultimately, that's what you know can solve this problem. But to attract that capital, you need higher long dated prices, which is why in our note, we recommended 
going long, long dated oil for precisely that reason. What about natural gas? I know it's a hard pivot because it's a different asset class, but we're seeing a bit of overlap here as Europe faces a winter of discontent where they're flat on their back. Where is the extra margin of supply going to come from for Europe at a time when the U.S. is exporting more than it ever has and is facing some constraints with production there? Well, I, I think the answer to that is look domestically. You're going to get it through weaker demand. You know, uh, we're bearish European natural gas going into January and February and see it trading below 100 euros per megawatt hour. Why? I like to point out no one ever gets hit by the train they see coming in the sense that, you know, <clears throat> the disruption happened in August. So you were able to make adjustments by reducing demand, industrial demand destruction, making substitution into two other fuels. Um, so we believe, you know, barring an absolutely freezing cold winter, they're going to get through this winter. Prices are going to moderate. But longer term, you have a problem. To go to your point, um, you know, you have to, you know, come up with supplies, whether it's through exports of LNG or um, domestic investment or substitution right. in other fuels. So longer term, you've got a problem in Europe. Jeffrey, unfair question, but it's unfair Thursday. What is the optimal price of a barrel of oil for OPEC? Well, if you look at where, where the equilibrium price should be, um, you know, it should be somewhere in that $85, $95 a barrel, mm. um, given the fact that that's where probably the cost structure in the U.S. Why do we know it's got to be somewhere in that, that vicinity? Because rigs were rising when we were above 100, and since we've been now below that 190, let's call it around 100, rig counts in the U.S. are coming off. They've been, they're off about 20, 25 rigs over the last three to four weeks, which is telling you're getting down in these levels, you're now below the equilibrium price. So somewhere in that, I'd say, $95, $100 a barrel seems to be where the market's functioning. Um, and we also look at, you know, that's where our price target is in 4Q, $100 a barrel. Um, and, you know, the potential for upside around that, I think, is substantial, going back to the point that, uh, you know, we're out of spare capacity. Hey, Jeff, wonderful to hear from you. It's been too long. Jeff Curry right. there of yeah, Goldman Sachs. Thank me. you, buddy. Wonderful, as always. Thank you very much. Equities are right now are down by 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P, or the Nasdaq down by more than one full percentage point. I keep running through the market boards for you. Yields are higher by nine basis points on a 10-year 382. Dollar just a bit stronger against the euro. Euro dollar 97.28. Done a lot on the gilt market already this morning. We'll keep doing that for you. Whipsawed yesterday by the Bank of England's gilt market operation. At the moment, 30s, 40s, 50s, pretty well behaved, given that the gilt market operation is going to run through the middle of October. The front end, though, up another 20 basis points, up 21 on twos, on tens, up 16. So, Tom, there's a clear divide. I'll keep going back to it. There is a clear divide in the UK bond market between what well, this Bank of England will touch right now in that operation announced yesterday and, and what they won't. I, I think it's an interesting ballet at Bank of England, and they'll be data dependent. We've got all the other fancy media phrases we talk about. John, this is about policy. This is about politics away from the Bank of England. And I'm monitoring very carefully what I see off the British press of Truss's comments today. You know what? She's no, you, you know, I, I guess the phrase in a mean spirit would be, you're no Winston Churchill. The fiscal I mean, authorities, you know, I don't know what to say. I would say, Tom, are not off the hook here. Yeah. And that was a narrative that came about yesterday because the Bank of England stepped in. They're not. It's targeted. It's 20 year plus. It's time limited. It goes through the middle of October. And if you look at what the Debt Management Office of the UK revealed last week to accommodate this extra fiscal right. effort, the debt issuance, a lot of it, is also going to come at the front end. So the Bank of England is not here to mop that up. Well, not you know, yet, anyway. Okay. That's not what they announced yesterday. It was targeted, and whatever the other fancy phrases from the PhDs, the yen intervention was targeted, and they're almost back to a 145. They hit 146. That's a failed intervention. When does that occur? A band-aid. Tom, none of yeah. that, the BOJ or the Bank of England, addresses the underlying mm. policy exactly. conflict. None of it. And that's what you need to address to really clear this out. Jeremy Stretch is going to join us shortly. They had a G10 FX strategy at CIBC. Looking forward to that. Yields are higher by nine basis points. Guess where stocks are? The negative. Lower three quarters of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. One of the strongest hurricanes ever to hit the U.S. has now been downgraded to a tropical storm. Ian has devastated parts of Florida, flooding homes, knocking out power to more than 2 million people. It's expected to be one of the costliest storms ever, causing more than $67 billion in damages and economic losses. The storm is forecast to move across central Florida and emerge over the Atlantic Ocean later today. The U.S. is now seeking ways to encourage British Prime Minister Liz Truss's team to dial back those dramatic tax cuts. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. Treasury Department is concerned about volatility in financial markets. It's working through the IMF to put pressure on the British government. Another leak has been found on the Nord Stream gas pipelines in the Baltic Sea. That brings a number to of ruptures to four. Now, several governments have called the leaks deliberate and sabotage. The pipelines carry gas from Russia to Europe. They were already out of action, but any hope that the Kremlin might turn gas flows back on have now been crushed. Japan's SoftBank Group has begun laying off employees at its loss-making vision fund. Bloomberg's learned it's expected to cut at least 30 percent of the staff. The Vision Fund unit has about 500 employees. It recently posted a $23 billion loss, with most of that coming from a plunge in valuations of portfolio, portfolio companies. And over to baseball, Aaron Judge of the New York Yankees hit his 61st home run Wednesday night, and that tied the American League record set by the Yankees' Roger Maris in 1961. Judge's success could help him negotiate a new contract when he becomes a free agent after the season. He reportedly turned down a seven-year, $213 million offer from the Yankees. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. What we've done is we've taken decisive action. First of all, to make sure that nobody is paying more than a typical fuel bill of £2,500. That will come in this Saturday. But also to reduce our tax burden, to make sure we grow the economy and also curb inflation. And that's so important. The market putting this government under a lot of pressure. That was Liz Truss, the UK Prime Minister from New York. Good morning. Equities lower by three quarters of one percent on the S&P, down by almost eight tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq, down by more than one full percentage point. Yields higher by nine basis points on a ten-year in America. Let's call that three eighty-three. The dollar was stronger against the euro, now unchanged. Euro dollar ninety-seven thirty-seven. I know you'd like to know where sterling is. I can tell you where it was as well, all over the place through the week so far. The low of the week, 103.50. That was Monday morning. The high was 109.16. Where we are presently, Tom, is just short of that level at yeah. 108.73. For Global Wall Street, the launch pad, the Bloomberg screen I use of equities, bonds, currencies, commodities is original today. John and I were talking about this stranger. And I haven't done a Miriam on it, John. Febrile. F-E-B-R-I-L-E. -E. That's what it looks like. It's different today. The symptoms of it's, fever. It's like underlying it, issues. Ooh, very good. Thank you. Tom, yeah. Thank you. Real problem. Very I had good. to look myself when Guy said the word yesterday. Yeah. English, so obviously, English just, you know, today. Went there the is a tradition in Toronto from CIBC of research that is always thought-provoking. I think of their wonderful Benjamin Tal, who is exquisite on American small business. So, too, in London, writing a brilliant note yesterday Jeremy Stretch joins us now, head of their G10 FX strategy. Jeremy, you didn't mince words. It is anarchy in the United Kingdom. What must the prime minister do? Well, I think it's very interesting to listen to those words from the prime minister this morning. There is no sign that uh, the government under this new prime minister, and remember, she's only been in situ for less than a month, um, the, you know, the government has put in place a very aggressive fiscal strategy, which ultimately the market does not believe in. And until there is a degree of rowing back in that strategy and at least uh, some degree of means or mechanism to try and make the sums add up, because, of course, that was part of the problem uh, with that uh, fiscal event last week. It was fiscal easing, but without any plans to uh, raise additional revenues. Until there is any signs of uh, market confidence that those sums can add up, then it seems to be the case that so the market is going to continue to pressure uh, the UK government, that it comes via the gilt market, particularly currently in the front end, uh, but also ultimately I think it will resolve itself via the currency as well. And I think the, the currency is probably going to be the obvious re release valve of choice. Jeremy, if you've got an idea of what kind of price we need for this to clear, 
how low does sterling need to go? How much higher do gilt yields need to go? How much work does the Bank of England need to do? Well, and that is, of course, the ultimate question. So clearly, as far as the work of the Bank of England, the market is currently pricing in that we could easily be getting towards six, six and a quarter percent in terms of the base rate uh, through the course of next year. I'm not sure that we get to that sort of magnitude. I think if we get to four and a quarter, that might be as far as the Bank of England can or should go, because, of course, uh, we're assuming a very substantive uh, downward correction in terms of activity levels next year. Probably growth is probably going to decline by around one, one and a quarter percent. Uh, so I think in the context of the clearing price for sterling, it is inevitably probably going to be another uh, move lower. So I think that 103.50 level that we saw in the Asian session on Monday will be tested. Uh, those parity probabilities have continued to explode over the course of the last few sessions. And I think we can and will see that level being tested. But I'm not sure necessarily there is a magnitude of uh, additional selling that will take us substantially beyond that. But I think it is going to be very much the case that sterling is going to remain on the defensive for the nearer term. And as I say, the Bank of England will continue to be pressured to do more, although I think the bank will be very reluctant to uh, look at an intermeeting hike because, of course, the bank is still very scarred by those events of 30 years ago with the ERM sure. crisis when the, the bank hiked but failed to defend the currency. It's just the next meeting, Lisa. It's a lifetime away. It's November 3rd. Lisa, November 3rd is the Bank of England decision. I believe the end of November is the budget. And October 14th is when this gilt market operation is due to finish. I just wonder if those dates all get ripped up and we have to rethink this whole thing. Especially if Liz Truss continues to double down and basically say, I'm not thinking at all of a shift, that the markets will do what they do and we're going to do the best that we can. And they're getting it wrong. How much, Jeremy, is there a pressure point, a pain point at which Liz Truss has to respond? And if not Liz Truss, then at least the Bank of England, given where the pound is headed and your expectation. Well, you're absolutely right. There, are, there, are, there is an obvious disconnect between all of those dates that you just mentioned. I'll throw another date into the mix. There is an S&P ratings review uh, coming on the 21st of October. And in the current context of what we've seen in terms of CDS uh, and the uh, increasing the cost of insuring UK debt, that does underline the risk of a potential downgrade as well. So there's an enormous degree of pressure on the government. But for, for current uh, expectations, they're showing no sign of uh, reversing course, which is quite remarkable in terms of the market pressure they're under. As far as the currency is concerned, well, it is very much the case that we are still headed lower. I think, the, as I say, the Bank of England, I think, will be very loath to be forced into intermeeting action. But clearly, I think if we were to see, you know, another 3 to 4% um, intraday move as far as sterling moving lower, then it will be very difficult for the bank to ignore that. And I think the pressure of them uh, to come in and try and put uh, some degree of uh, interest rate floor in the market by uh, an unexpected hike will inevitably accelerate. Jeremy Stretch, thank you, sir. From CIBC. That Thanks calendar, enough. Tom. Thank you, Jeremy. That calendar, Tom. October 14th uh, yeah, is when yeah. this gilt market operation finishes. That's the schedule. November 3rd is the Bank of England rate decision. And then later in November is the budget. Does that get ripped up? I, I, I think we've got to move much forward from that. I haven't done the standard deviation studies this morning. And, John, what I would suggest, we heard this from one of our guests earlier. You can think it out all you can, but you never know where it's going to come from. And none of this even talks about, you know, Michael Purvis is brilliant on ADXY. None of this talks about Pacific Rim upset. You know, I, just, I don't know where it's going to come from, but I can't get out to November right now. I'd throw in Italy as well. With yes, the yes. With another 17 well basis points. Yeah. Lisa, we're at 470, basically, <clears throat> on the Italian 10-year this morning. Yeah, all different sides of the same story. How much more is the dollar going to possibly rise or strengthen versus all of these other currencies forcing them to raise rates in order to attract uh, funding at a time when they need it? They need it to support their economies in the face of the energy crisis that's looming down over the winter. At what point do you get some sort of realization in the population of how much imported inflation is going up because of the weakness of these currencies? And it becomes very much more a political issue. We've talked about a policy conflict across several dimensions within the United Kingdom. The other policy conflict, and it's been the story of the last six months, I would argue, in the FX market, is the conflict between the Fed and every other central bank trying to claim a stronger currency. Kit Jukes of Sogchen framed Great it perfectly. It's brilliant this morning. Lisa, it read as follows. Fed policy in the war in Ukraine, everything else, noise. Went on to say, in short, the dollar goes on rising until the Fed slows down, the war ends, or the US decides that it's time for Son of Plaza. 
And at what point is that a positive or is that a negative because the U.S. is flat on its back and where is this uh, peripheral growth going to come from? But that's very much where we are. And what we're <clears> hearing <throat> from Fed officials, right. we heard from a lot of them yesterday. They're all coming out I, and they're saying they're focused on inflation. There's more work to do. John, I really want to point out Z Ellen Zentner of uh, Morgan Stanley. I wrote this banner out early this yeah, morning. I saw that, Tom. Pushes yeah. against what Kit Juke says. I've got a fancy pants chart on this, but I'm with Zentner. It's not enough excessive move yet to get you to the plaza dance. And the conditions now are so different than the early 1980s. Would you share that fancy pants chart with us in a little bit, Tom? In maybe it, 10 it, minutes' time. It's like a Bloomberg chart. I've got to get, you know. That. That's, a, that's a good we, chart. We've we got to go down. It's just above Text. Home Depot downstairs they make okay, that. Okay, go, go fetch it, TK. This is Bloomberg. Monetary policy is meant to be boring. Monetary policy is meant to calm nerves. No doubt we are seeing dysfunction in the markets overseas, but at this point, the Fed is primarily focused on those inflation figures. Some stabilization for the markets would be a good thing. Investors are becoming increasingly concerned about, you know, not just the U.S. economic outlook, but the global outlook. The blinking is probably going to start in 2023 when the U.S. Fed cycle, you know, essentially comes to an end. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abram. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keen. An historic week for markets. We will look at equities, bonds, currencies, and in a moment, commodities with one of the giants of the industry. But right now, John, I'm going to call German inflation, I'm going to call it maybe a little uh, <clears throat> elevated over what we've seen and what the survey predictions have been. Double digit inflation, Tom, in Germany. Truly historic double-digit inflation in Germany, and put this in the diary, the next ECB meeting, October 27. There are going to be people on the governing council of the ECB that want QT and a monster rate hike. And, Tom, we've seen this policy conflict play out between financial <coughs> stability and monetary policy in the UK in the last 24 hours. Does that play out in Europe in a more pronounced way, with some on the committee pushing harder for more tightening to bring inflation back down? At the same time, you start to see some financial <coughs> stability risk bubbling away in right. the bond market. And this is so important. And folks, so we follow on from what we did yesterday. Thank you for all the notes from radio and TV over the quality of the guests yesterday. We're going to continue that in this hour. The laureate Michael Spence will join us late in the hour. Just thrilled at that honor. John, I want you to frame right now the political dialogue you hear from Britain this morning. Well, Tom, I don't hear a lot, and that's the issue. There is no backtracking here whatsoever. <clears throat> Policy conflict is the way we're all framing this and have been for the last month or so between fiscal authorities who are pushing for growth and monetary authorities who are trying to get inflation lower. But something Mohamed al talked about yesterday I think is really important. We have a new policy conflict now within the Bank of England between a set of individuals who want policy to attack inflation and bring inflation lower and another set, perhaps the same, who are very concerned about financial stability. And the question we're asking is whether you can tackle inflation by raising interest rates and address financial stability risk by buying bonds. Can you do both at the same time? Lisa, what I saw yesterday was a defeat of like spread analysis and conventional analysis just down to price. We saw seven standard deviation move in the long-term gilt Bloomberg index. I mean, it is just about price of bonds, price lower yields higher. Yeah, and just the whipsaw move. These are markets that are not expected to move like this. And we've been talking about it. John opened uh, the beginning of this show with this, this idea of what happens when full faith and credit becomes the most risky part of the market. It becomes very difficult to find <clears throat> conviction. And so even though yesterday you saw the biggest one-day gain on the Bloomberg Aggregate Index going back to at least 2,000, yeah. even though you saw those <clears throat> big gains, that is usually what you see in a bear market with very little conviction that will not necessarily be met with the same sort of policy rescue as in the past. Let's go to the data right now to get to Ken Tropen here. John, German two-year is something I would look at here, a spike up to 1.95 percent, maybe a bit quiescent given that double-digit inflation. Yields up around the world on a 10-year in Italy. We're up by 21 basis points now, 471. I think I can round that up to almost 472. That's Italy. On Treasuries, we're up by 9 or 10 basis points to 383. The euro's weaker, dollar stronger, 97.23. And in the gilt market, Tom, we've talked about this a few times, 
a clear divide between the stuff that the Bank of England will buy in the secondary market in the guilt operation announced yesterday and the stuff they won't touch. The 10-year in the UK <clears throat> is up 18 basis points. The 50-year is down by a couple of basis points and the 30-year is up only four. This is a great joy right now. Uh, he's one of my heroes and also had the joy of working with a guy named John Henry a few years ago. Mr. Henry was what we call a turtle trader based on trend and commodities, coined a few dollars and ended up owning a small baseball team in Boston. And John, there's a, there's a soccer team in Liverpool, I think, that's been doing fairly well recently. Over the last few years. Over that. There that would okay be John Henry. Now. Giving John Henry immense help was Kenneth Tropin. He is the founder, the chairman of Graham Capital. We're thrilled that he could join us this morning. Ken, how do you do trend investment in commodities? A CTA structure, given all the financial instability of the moment. Yeah, well, you know, look, uh, the systems that we use in trend following are pretty long-term in nature. So some of the short-term volatility we're seeing over the last few days, you know, we, we, it's going to help us one day. It's going to hurt us another day. Hopefully over some period of weeks and months, it works out pretty successfully. Uh, I think it's important to note that Graham does both discretionary trading and uh, systems trading, and they're very different in how they react to short-term market behavior. The short-term market behavior is backed by this concept of hedging. Hedging in 1998 didn't work out because of substantial leverage. Do you detect another shadow, another ghost out there right now that would be like excess leverage in 1998? I'm not so sure it's a leverage issue. I think you have uh, a, a profound problem, which is that central banks for 11 or 12 years between 2009 post-financial crisis and 2021 had globally coordinated easy monetary policy. Uh, now we have a very, very inflationary reaction to 12 years of very, very easy policy, and it is a very difficult spot they're in to try and get a control on inflation in an environment where the market's used to easy monetary policy, and you can see some of this volatility is really a reaction function to that problem the central banks are having. And Ken, you called this volatility, at least in the short term, crazy, the technical word for it, uh, in, in some of your written statements. I'm wondering, given the crazy volatility, if there is a trade to put on where the safety is, or is it just in cash and pile it up and sit there and wait? You know, uh, look, there's a lot to do in the markets. Uh, and it's kind of interesting being at the helm of a hedge fund that both is in discretionary trading, which uh, involves a lot of shorter term reaction on the bar on the part of our traders. And, and, and our systems are so long term in nature. But for example, after yesterday's move, where we saw unprecedented, uh, you know, price volatility, and particularly in, uh, in, in UK fixed income, but, but in global fixed income, most of our traders sort of cleared the books and decided to step aside. And I kind of like that in a trader where they don't have a hero mentality, they have a survivor mentality. On the other hand, our systems, you know, which are long term, they kind of ignored the volatility yesterday. We gradually reduce positions as markets get more volatile. We sometimes will increase them when markets get less volatile, but the reaction function is pretty slow. Ken, given the fact that your traders stepped away and they were not alone, a lot of traders have stepped away, the trading volumes are getting thinner. The liquidity is getting less and less, even in some of the most liquid instruments in the world. How concerned does that make you to the point of financial stability? Well, it's something we focus on every day at Graham. We have a risk committee that meets every morning. We have since 2007. And one of the things we focus on is what's happening in liquidity and how has it changed since the last period? And is, it, is there a problem spot for any of the positions we might have on? And we want to be the first to get out, not the last to get out, because that's always when you have a problem uh, from a right. trader's perspective. And so, yeah, I, I think liquidity is, is, is down. It's not evaporated. There's plenty of liquidity in most of the big markets, but it's something you really right. have to keep an eye on. Ken, I want to go back to you know, what John Henry and you and Monroe Trout and others invented. And it was a time when there was an actual sharp ratio, an actual risk-free rate. And of course, that all went away. It evaporated in this era. Nassim Taleb mentions that the gravity has come back to our physics. 
do you shift what you're doing now because finally we've got a real rate? Finally, we've got a risk-free rate. Finally, we have gravity. Well, we, you know, I think the most important thing uh, to look at is, is, is that we have significant inflation. And significant inflation means that uh, central banks have to respond, and that creates trading opportunity. That's, that's the way I think about it. Sure, we're, we're, we're generating on, you know, uh, uh, Fed funds significant uh, income, whereas, you know, a year ago there was none, right? Um, I think the most interesting comparison I can give you is if you look at the performance of equities from 2009 to 2021, there was a, 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 an, a it was sort of an, a golden period for beta investing, right? You had plus 10% average annual returns for stocks at least at a time where risk free rates were almost zero. So the spread between risk free rates and what you made by investing in equities was as, uh, the highest in history. Now in an inflationary world where risk free rates are rising and equities are having a tough time, that relationship's flipped on its head. Kenneth, wonderful to catch up with you, and hopefully we can have a longer conversation again in the future, sir. Kenneth Trop in there of Graham Capital. I want to pick up on what's happened in the last 10 minutes as well, with German inflation coming in at double digits. Just 15 minutes or so after we heard from the government, the Schultz administration financing the latest emergency intervention in energy by redeploying a fund created to help offset the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. The fund, listen to these numbers, will be bolstered with new borrowing of at least 150 billion euros to cover the cost of the gas price cap, according to people familiar with the matter. Yields on a 10-year lease are at 227 in Germany right now, about 15 basis points on a session. Last December, they were negative almost 40 basis points. That gives you an idea of the change we've seen, Bremo, in the last 12 months or so. They're the highest at one point going back to 2011. That's at the height of the Euro debt crisis, taking a look at some of the risk that's getting priced in. This is the conundrum. You have central banks that want to fight inflation. You have governments that need to provide some assistance and want to borrow to do it. And the bond market is rebelling. Everything seems to be in conflict. <laughs> when in the pandemic, everything was supporting each other. What a time in this market. Time. Equities down 1% on For the S&P. triple leverage cash. You're doing all right, aren't you? Love You're so happy this year. Yeah, I know you every are. Day I know. It just, just gets better and better. Like You're getting awesome. a lot of inflows, TK. I'm almost double digit. I'm not there yet. Close I'm, the fund I'm now. Like, you know, before I take my fee, I'm 7%. You sank the marketing team. You're not it's raising fresh capital. Triple leverage cash. I do a 2 and 20 split. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Florida is assessing the damage from one of the most powerful and costliest hurricanes in U.S. history. Ian has been downgraded to a tropical storm. Now it's expected to keep battering the state with winds and torrential rains before moving out into the Atlantic Ocean and from there into Georgia and the Carolinas. An estimated 2.5 million homes and businesses are without power. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is pushing ahead with the annexation of the parts of Ukraine that its troops control after sham elections. And that puts the Kremlin on another collision course with the U.S. and its allies. Russia will sign treaties to absorb the four regions at a ceremony on Friday. Another leak has been found on the Nord Stream gas pipeline in the Baltic Sea, and that brings the total number of ruptures to four. Several governments have called the leaks deliberate and sabotage. The pipelines carry gas from Russia to Europe. They were already out of action, but any hope that the Kremlin might turn gas flows back on have now been crushed. Well, Porsche has gone public. Shares of the sports car maker began trading today after Europe's largest IPO in a decade. Parent Volkswagen raised more than $9 billion, pricing the stock at the top end of the initial range. The offering valued Porsche at $73 billion. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
the market is really pushing them into a corner to do something huge. Uh, and without them acting in that way, effectively, the pound's going to go down further. So, um, you know, it, it, it remains to be seen how much will be needed on the day itself. But I would suggest that, uh, you know, at least 100 basis points is going to be needed at that point. Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank, the day itself that he's talking about, referring to, is November 3rd. November 3rd, the next scheduled Bank of England monetary policy decision, which feels like a lifetime away. Futures, negative 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, futures there down 1.3%. You'll tire by eight basis points on a 10-year in America. The Treasury, 381.58. Dollar, a little stronger. Euro, a bit weaker. Euro dollar, 97. 20 minutes ago, Tom, inflation in Germany. Double-digit CPI. Double-digit inflation in Germany. And just one of the events there, but shows a data dependency becoming data reality. And that's what Madame Lagarde will face here in the coming days and weeks. We spoke to him in London, which seems ages ago, given all this financial turmoil. But joining us again with just wonderful critical thinking skills across economics and finance from Bank of New York, Mellon. Jeffrey Yu joins us uh, this morning. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time with thank us today. You. you have studied as a student at LSE, I believe it was, Black Wednesday in 1992. And the theater is that market participants can corner a market, as George Soros and others did back then. Can the markets corner the prime minister of the United Kingdom? Well, there's certainly... Um trying to do that within the currency market you know, at this point. Um, but the Bank of England is providing some relief. Um, you look at the Bank of England's reserves this time around, they're not even going to try with a pound, right? Some Central Eastern European countries have more than the BOE at this point. But they can get into the gilt market, which is something much more within their control. And it's a market that now that they're on one side, it seems like uh, the rest of the market doesn't want to be on the other side of. Jeff, this is a Band-Aid and the Band-Aid gets ripped off again on October 14th. Jeff, what do things look like by the time we get to October 14? October 14th is a lifetime away. Monday is the immediate risk, and because now it appears the Chancellor does have the backing of the Prime Minister, we head into Tory party conference. That speaking slot, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, UK time, is he, when speaking to the base, really going to double down you know, on the tax cuts and everything else that's been announced? This is the Tory party conference. I think he's actually going to go for that, and that's going to be the next risk event. You know, 14th, you can forget about that. It's really Monday that matters now. So do you think that 14th, that day in the diary, just gets scrubbed, Jeff, and this operation has to continue for a whole lot longer? Uh, this is, I think, what the market is tactically now doing. So, Because remember the issue with forward guidance, the issue with forward guidance on the policy basis, you just squish all of the volatility towards the end date. Exactly the same thing happening uh, right now. You're going to squish all of the potential gilt market volatility towards the 14th. And when they look at swaps involved, when they look at some of the leading indicators, the BOE could realise that without changes on the fiscal side of things, they're going to be facing with the same problem. So I do, extend, uh, I, I do expect this to extend, of course, pending decisions from number 11. Jeff, how is this not basically just uh, financing through monetary uh, support the, the deficit and, and the financial plans of Liz Truss? So size matters uh, first. Um, the initial allocations are relatively small. Uh, and the BOE have gone to great pains to stress. This came from the FPC. This is a financial stability argument. Uh, this is something that's time limited, quantum limited. Uh, but if it gets extended, if the quantity becomes uh, more extended as well, then I think markets can see through this easily. But again, they're not going to attack by the gold market. They're going to go through sterling. But it raises an issue, and we've been talking about it all morning, this conflict between uh, trying to lower inflation and combating financial stability. Mohamed Alarian in conversation with John was talking about this very point. Are we looking at inflation that's going to be much higher for much longer because there is an unwillingness to allow markets to just completely grind to a halt, which could be the consequence of some of the rate hikes that are getting projected? Uh, well, it seems like central bankers are willing to push things as much as possible, but, and the BOE has shown this yesterday, not at the risk of financial stability. So global central banks are making the argument, and it's a very strong argument, you know, let's stress this, that since 2008, regulation, capitalization, supervision, all of that, it's improved to the extent that they are not looking at the 2007-2008 like scenarios. So they can push the envelope a bit more and then try to squeeze the household. Chairman Powell said there is going to be pain, but the risk is you don't know where that limit right. is. Over. Right. So where's the opportunity right now, Jeff? You is it a 
Is it an obscure FX trade off the Pacific Rim and with the COVID add-on? Where's the opportunity within this uh, clamor? Well, the opportunity is basically, it's um, the two sides of the same coin. Where do you call the top in the dollar? When do you call the top um, in the dollar? Uh, so we're looking at where the under position markets are. And yes, you know, I would say in Asia. So uh, a lot of clients are flagging, you know, if China reopens earlier than expected, you get a demand boost there. Alli asset allocation will go through uh, into those areas. The EM in particular is very under positioned right now. We're looking at Brazil, going to have very positive real rates right. at year end. After day, possibly okay, but what, what do you do with Korea as the non-China? I mean, is Korean won the mother of all buys right now? Well, not yet. A Korean won, you know, Taiwanese dollar, all those China proxy currencies, you cannot increase asset allocation until there's a clear growth story from China. And right now, when you've got China battling to try okay. to contain depreciation expectations in its currency, mm. I don't think they're there yet. If CMY depreciates 5%, you're not going to get positive 5% in the Korean won. Jeff, we have a responsibility to talk about this delicately. But mm. I want to ask you this question. How close did we come to a real accident yesterday morning so yesterday morning clearly you know, things were rumbling we did get close um to an accident now how big an accident i think now it's only you can't prove the counterfactual but based you know, on the allocations uh, in the operation yesterday maybe it wasn't as big an accident as uh, things made out to be we have to remind the ldi environment in the uk very heavily regulated um the boe was always going to be able to react in size in force I would say if there were a real accident, we would have seen the BOB come in later in the day, but much more forcefully, much stronger. It would have been unlimited duration quota. But now, because they had advanced warning, they could have added some limitations to this. When it comes to financial stability in markets, it's whatever it takes. Jeff Yu, thank you, sir, of Bank of New York Mellon. And if it's whatever it takes, Lisa, does that mean it's no longer whatever it takes to bring inflation back down? Because can it be whatever it takes to bring inflation down and whatever it takes to preserve financial stability? The answer probably is no. It's hard to understand how this could possibly be yes, how they could get their he uh, yeah, have their cake and eat it too. How much is this going to work in contrast with each other if they want to fight inflation but aren't willing to allow the market to do what it does as it raises rates? And then we get basically them backing away and then yields have to go up at the long <sighs> end because you've got inflation expectations over the longer term that have to logically go up. The struggle to normalize here, Tom, to find this new equilibrium without central bank distortion. It is going to be so, so hard. And this was one of those fractures, a big, big fracture, I would argue, along that, along that effort. I, I, John, I just, I, I'm going to go back to the boring thing I've said on and on. We're coming out of a natural disaster. We have a war on top of it. And the simple solution, think of Greece a couple of years ago. Extend out the x-axis, and that's the only political way to solve the problem. Ray Farris, the chief economist at Credit Suisse, will join us very shortly. Yields off the highs, up just six basis points on a 10-year, 379.56. Equities on the S&P, down nine-tenths of 1%. Waiting for some economic data here in the United States of America. Equity futures going into that down eight tenths of one percent on the S&P. The Nasdaq 100 down by more than one full percentage point. Mike McKee's away, so I'll butcher these numbers for you in just a Good moment. Job. It was up by five or six basis points on a 10-year, 378.76 <clears throat> claims. Big downside surprise. 193. Can, can, we, can we sit on that? Yes, please. 193k. The economy is terrible. Was 215. Lisa, your thoughts at 193 on jobless claims in America? This is not what the Fed wants to see. It's great for the employment picture for the United States because it seems like very few people, possibly one of the fewest reads ever in terms of filings for new uh, employment <coughs> claims and to get uh, unemployment benefits. But this does seem to be moving in the opposite direction from a Fed that wants to see a tightening labor market, that wants to see uh, employers having an easier time hiring people and not having to fork over such high wages. Amazon, by the way, just raised their minimum wage yet again to attract people even as margins are getting squeezed. Not the picture necessarily this central bank wants to see. Personal consumption decent as well, Tom, relative to the expectation for the second quarter, 1.5%. Yeah. So the extra read we just got comes in at 2%. 
Just for claims, TK, 193, 193,000. That, that is a tight labor market in the minds of many people. Yeah, four-week moving average is just what I like to take. Easy to see off the Bloomberg folks. And I'm going to just roll it out as 250, down to 240, down to 222. How about 217,000, John? The economy's terrible, John. I mean, I just... Can we have a moment of silence for James Glassman of J.P. Morgan? He has killed this. A big fan he's of Jim, I Absolutely. He's absolutely nailed this. A few other people as well. Getting a third read on a whole host of indicators for the second quarter, but what stands out here is the latest data yeah. on initial jobless claims. Off the back of it, yield mm. still higher at the front end by six basis points. Tom, a two-year, 419. And uh, futures are negative 35, Dow futures negative 224. Right now, and this is a huge joy to know the team that Neil Soss of Credit Suisse put together decades ago at Credit Suisse. It, it included the giant Dominic Constum, now over at Mizuho, and still at Credit Suisse is Ray Ferris. He owned the high ground on Pacific Rim analysis and also foreign exchange in London for the shop. We're thrilled that the chief economist at Credit Suisse joins us this morning. I, I, I'm going to cut right to the chase, Ray, and this goes into your foreign exchange uh, background. Yesterday was original. What is the original solution for the prime minister? Well, look, I'm thrilled to be here. I've been a long time listener to the show, and it's, it's great to be on. But I just wanted to address the elephant in the room. That is a fantastic bow tie. I love it. Um, I, I think it was said a little bit earlier by one of the guests that, you know, the U.K. increasingly needs to be viewed in the context of an emerging market sort of situation. Not that they're going to default on their debt, but the economy has lost a nominal anchor for the system. And that's, I think, why investors don't want to hold bonds and they don't want to hold the <clears> currency. Right. The fiscal agent looks like it's a little out of control. And the Bank of England isn't stepping up to the plate to regain control, to establish that nominal anchor by saying that we don't care what happens on fiscal, we're going to control inflation. What needs to happen here is the Bank of England needs to step in. They need to be aggressive with their next rate hike. It'd be better if they move before November. And they need to signal that they will do more after that. Markets are pricing very high rates as the terminal rate. They don't have to get there if right. they act. You have a huge credibility with Asia and with China, with Japan. And you come out and calculate 1.6% global growth for next year. Are we pricing for that? No, I don't think we are. Certainly not in equities. Um, the way we look at equities and... I wear two hats at Credit Suisse. I'm chief economist, but also the chief investment officer for the Americas. Uh, about three weeks ago, we went underweight in our investment wealth division equities for the first time since 2013. That's really a huge move for us. And when we look at equities, we think, as we just published yesterday, our new economic quarterly, the worst is yet to come, was the title. And it's all about the fact that nominal growth is going to slow financing costs are going up, and wage growth, the persistence of a lot of costs, you know, are, are going to be there for another few quarters. So profits are going to get squeezed, margins look too high, consensus earnings look too high. To that point, Ray, let's go back to some of the data that we just got. The initial jobless claims of 193,000. It was the expectation of 215,000. You hear the Fed saying that they want to see a little bit more slack in this labor market or even a lot more with the projection of 4.5% of an unemployment rate, uh, possibly by next year. How far away are we? What kind of Fed funds rate do we need to get to the type of slack, to the loosening of this labor market required to bring inflation down? Oh, absolutely. The Fed's going to be angry about these numbers. Um, I, we've got a forecast of 4.5%, well, really uh, 4 and 5 eighths for Fed funds as the terminal rate. But we stress we don't really know where this thing could peak and that the, there's an asymmetry still in the Fed's reaction function to the top side. They have shown that they aren't going to ease just because numbers get or turn a little bit less hawkish, just because numbers get a bit better, the June, July CPI data. And they will respond aggressively if the numbers, you know, aren't so nice, the August CPI data. So could they hike beyond what the market's got priced, you know, the four and a half percent for terminal rate next year? Yes. Do they, I think, just really dislike? the idea that markets have got a cut price for 2023, and are they going to continue to argue against that? Absolutely.
Ray, we saw from the Bank of England the conundrum that's becoming increasingly a global conundrum and perhaps may face this Federal Reserve, which is when do you reach the breaking point and then how do they counteract that from a financial stability perspective? What is the break point when it comes to real yields, which we saw hit 1.6 percent just a few trading days ago? Where is the break point for this market and then for the Federal Reserve to have to step in on a stability stance? Well, let me identify three different things here. The, the first is that one of the, the key reasons I think real yields are going as high as they are, back into positive territory, is that balance sheet strength in the United States, especially <clears throat> within the housing sector, is the best that it's been in, you know, depending on your metric, anywhere between 20 to 30 years. The Fed has to push up yields much more than we would have thought a year and a half, two years ago, to actually slow the system down. And that's kind of what the right. claims data. The second thing is, I'm here in Dallas. I was meeting with a lot of retail corporates yesterday. And when I asked, are we in a recession, everybody in the room put their hand up. The key thing here is there's a dichotomy in this economy. The goods sector, the cyclical components, housing and goods, right. already are in a recession. Services is doing just fine. And that's where you're getting this continued labor force growth, now some real income growth. And the Fed's just going to have to keep pushing against it. Futures deteriorate on negative 1.4 percent S&P futures. The VIX out two big figures, 32.23, not through the highs yesterday. But the stress is out there off of the uh, good news we saw on claims. Uh, Ray Ferris, I want to speak to you about the U.S. economy and the Fed's path forward. If we get a real rate out to 2.05 percent, which is my calculation of maybe great financial crisis, average before the crisis, I should say. Do you suggest they need to overshoot on the real rate to really turn things around? Or can they go to just above 2% and stabilize, sit there? We think that they're going to be able to, our, our base case is that they're going to be able to pull off a tiny bit of growth. And a lot of that is because of this balance sheet position that households are in. If we're going to go into a recession in the next you know, 12 to 18 months, it's not going to be because we're forced into it by financial distress. It's going to be because consumers choose to retrench. But with this type of employment growth, they're probably not going to do that. Do we have to get the, you know, now very fashionable vacancy to unemployment ratio down a lot to get wage growth to come down? Well, history says no, vacancy to unemployment doesn't actually forecast wage growth very well. So we think it's going to be a tough fight. The Fed's probably going to have to go to 4.5%. They could go a bit above that. But, you know, we've got employment growth, uh, payrolls coming down to 150 or so by the end of the year, early next year. And then, you know, I think the risk is maybe we go a bit softer. Gradually, that'll pull down wage growth. Goods inflation is going to come down. Looks like housing on a forecast basis has already peaked. Services are going to be a problem for a while, but they're going to edge off. So... We're optimistic that by the end of next year, the Fed's going to be much closer to where it wants to be without necessarily having to pull the economy into a recession. Ray, Tom's going to send you a signed bow tie. How would you like that? Oh, fantastic. I can't wait. I'll make it happen. Ray Ferris there of Credit Suisse. TK, how much do you pay him for that? It Send depends where I'm buying it. If I'm walking by Credit Suisse in Zurich and going into the Hermes in Zurich, it's a little more. Reto, keeper of the Amex oh, from he, Zurich, is expense, aware of this. You expensed that one, did you? <laughs> Tom, 193. Just take a step back. Think about how people outside <clears throat> oh, of this world I, would observe the conversation we've just had. It's just this surreal. Federal Reserve, just surreal. unelected, would be angry. They would be angry that jobless claims were at 193. Now, people on Wall Street understand why that's part of the conversation. But can you imagine, Tom, for the rest of the electorate who aren't familiar with this conversation and they hear right. Senator Warren say things exactly. like this Fed is trying to push us into a recession. <clears throat> yeah. This one is a really hard thing for this Fed to communicate. And I'll keep going back to this. How does the Fed, once these numbers turn the other way, communicate to people that this is the price we have to pay to get inflation lower and this is something we need to do? I think Warren is on to something here. Let me, when I met Elizabeth Warren, John, the first time, nobody knew who she was. She's an arch expert on bankruptcy law in America. She's the real deal. And people criticize her when she comes over to economics, when she comes over maybe to centrist politics. But the answer is she's dead on on the pulse of America. Wait a minute. We want to increase the unemployment rate? Really? That's a hard thing to process, Lisa. <clears throat> and politically going into the midterms, 
I think we're going to hear a lot more of this, aren't we? Well, especially if you end up with a situation where the Fed explains that this is the reason they have to hike even more because it's not moving in the direction they want to see. So if the Fed's angry with these numbers, you know who's angrier? All the other central banks yeah, exactly. that are looking for the Fed and saying, please slow down. <laughs> Slow down. 100%. Coming up, Gershon Distant Fad of Alliance Bernstein. Looking forward to that. Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites. Seema Shah of Principal Global Investors. All of that coming up into the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Florida woke up today to a disaster. Ian has been downgraded to a tropical storm, but it's left misery in its wake. There is flash flooding, 2.5 million homes and businesses are without power, and parts of the state are still getting drenched. Ian will go down as one of the most powerful and costly hurricanes ever to hit the U.S. The potential losses could approach $70 billion. British Prime Minister Liz Truss is defending that package of unfunded tax cuts that sent markets into turmoil. Truss spoke today to local radio stations. It's a difficult time. We're facing a global economic crisis brought about by Putin's war in Ukraine. And what was right is that Britain took decisive action to help people get through what is going to be a difficult winter. Trust said that higher taxes are even more likely to lead the UK into recession. Germany is moving to limit the impact of soaring energy costs. Chancellor, oh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz's administration will put a cap on natural gas prices, and it will pay for that by redeploying a fund created to help offset the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Plus, Bloomberg has learned there will be new borrowing of at least $146 billion. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. of the UK debt is inflation linked and that's something that's very different to any other market around the world. So the BOE really needs to keep an, a hawkish eye on inflation and in controlling inflation and it's not just in order to generate price stability, it's actually also to control their debt costs. Katrina Dudley from Franklin Mutual, just brilliant yesterday on institutional responsibility to protect shareholders with prices plunging in fixed income. Lisa Bramlett and Tom Keener, John Farrell getting ready for an important 9 o'clock hour uh, as well. Futures deteriorate down 49. The VIX out two points earlier, 31.99 right now. Our team is committed to bringing you voices within this crisis, and there's none on policy and economics more competent in this world than Michael Spence, the laureate of Stanford New York University and, of course, chairman of General Atlantic's Global Growth Institute. Uh, Professor Spence, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I want to go to another time and place in your ute when you were studying with John Hicks long ago. Let us go, folks, to okay. 1981 in William Grider's classic The Atlantic Essay on a very young David Stockman. The whole thing is premised on faith. The inflation premium melts away like the morning mist, a great battle over the conventional theories of economic performance. David Stockman in the middle of Reaganomics. Michael Spence, the tumult of the last 48 hours seems like a Reaganomics redux. Is it? It, it, it looks like it, Tom, but I, don't, I actually don't think it is. So both... Um, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were dealing with a situation in which you had embed inflation, uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, kind of stagflation pattern, low growth. And they, they were basically trying to remove the constraints and obstacles to higher rates of growth. That, that meant cutting back government uh, and cutting back, you know, unfortunate and dysfunctional regulation. I, I think this is a completely different situation. We've lived in the you know, liberated economics world for a long time, and we're we're actually going a different direction. So I, I, you know, I mean, 
policies are always context specific, but but I, I don't think this is a, analogous to that situation. So then, what situation is this? What is the policy prescription for the United Kingdom, or quite frankly, China or any others? What is the new Spence prescription? Well, it, it starts with recognizing that we, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, we we have quite suddenly shifted into a supply constrained world. So, you know, growth strategies based on expanding demand don't make any sense. I mean, I think that's the core of the mistake that's been made in the U.K. You just don't cut taxes if the supply side can't respond, especially if you're fighting the central bank, uh, who's trying to get, you know, nearly out of control inflation back under control. And then at that, you know, and I, think, I think you have to face the fact that in the short run, we don't have any choice. The supply side agenda that we really need you know, reversing the productivity trends isn't going to happen overnight. So the central banks, who are a little late to the game, but in an awkward position, just have to, you know, deal with the inflation thing by trimming back the demand side as best they can and as delicately as they can. Um, but then the rest of the agenda should be focused on real supply side constraints, both domestic and global. Um, and there are a lot of them, aging populations, you know, fading deflationary pressures from the emerging economies, uh, diversification in global supply chains, the energy transition in Europe. I mean, the list is very long, and I won't bore you with the whole thing. But, but you know, that's the situation that we have to. Bottom line is, pro, we need a productivity surge. Without that, or to get there, there is also an issue with how do you fiscally arrange a, a situation where deficits are not easy to finance anymore. How concerned are you about the inability of a lot of nations to finance some of the developments required to increase productivity, required to increase growth in the face of inflation that is persistent? I'm very worried. I mean, you know, one, one, of, the, one of the other sort of constraints that, that, that you talked about before, Lisa, was the rising um, levels of sovereign debt. You know, and in a rising inflationary environment, you know, then that... <laughs> That, on, in many countries, maybe the United States is uniquely an exception, um, places fairly severe constraints on the kinds of investments that form a portion of, you know, sensible growth strategies, you know, supply-side-oriented growth strategies of the type that right. we, you know, the bills we passed recently in the U.S. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, a, essentially a reason right. why, why we may not be able to dig our way out of this hole all that fast. Well, to your re writing, recent writings on investment, sir, and I, I'm going to assume that Chad Jones, Berkeley to Stanford, was a Michael Spence disciple. He's got the definitive book on post-solo productivity, and that's all great. But the answer is we need capital deepening. How do we do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you make sensible choices. So you, the first thing you do is you don't do is cut revenues, right? I mean, you know, if we're going to get out of this, we all have to pay a price. The politicians have a tough job convincing people that's right. But basically, you know, we have to finance the investments we need to get out of this. And that means probably um, some at least holding fast on the tax situation, if not increasing them. Michael Spence, thank you so much. An honor to uh, have you with us today from always Stanford and New York University and Great Atlantic uh, as well. Coming to us from Italy uh, today. Lisa, I really can't say enough about how every research note from the smart crew comes back to something we don't want to talk about, which is the complexities of productivity. Peter Bookvar publishes moments ago echoing what we heard from Professor Spence. This is a difficult moment, and it is not an over-exaggeration to say it is a sea change. It is an inflection point. This is a new era where fiscal policy cannot have the same effect and monetary mm -hmm. policy cannot have the same effect as it's had in the past. It's very difficult when suddenly the policy prescription, the knee-jerk policy prescription of the past, yeah. does not work. It's counterproductive even at this point because inflation suddenly has reared its head in a way that people have not seen for generations. These times are just so, so unusual in the blur of the screen and it's a screen with a certain frenzy to it within this crisis today lisa i continue to go to pound sterling 108.80 a little bit of a lift of pound in the last 20 minutes not that that matters but that's my observation. And how much is this a dollar story? We've been talking about this, right? People pointing fingers at the UK's policy prescription on the political side as the culprit behind this. How much are they really 
leading the way in terms of what other governments can, uh, can expect, perhaps in a more extreme version. But if you're trying to juice growth, it is not easy to do so. It is not cheap. And that well, is the reason why Michael Spence was saying he's very concerned that we're not going to dig our way out of this hole for quite a while, which kind of goes to the whole lost decade of profits kind of question. Well, then I'll say 20 minutes earlier this morning, a research note from Ellen Zentner suggesting at Morgan Stanley, we are distant from dollar excess in a plaza-like accord, and Kit Jukes at the same time sending, saying, Sen son of plazas here, Lisa. I mean, that's a kind of tension that's out there. And right now, the administration uh, of President Biden has come out and said, there's no need because right now the strong well, dollar is helping bring down inflation. So what's the real motivation there to offset that? Claims stun and show a fully employed America, I believe. Futures at negative 46 of VIX was out two figures, 31.92. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg.